Good morning. I would like to call to order the adjourned regular meeting and special meeting noticed for today. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. May we have the roll call, please? Councilmember Shepard Rami? Here. Councilmember Udi? Here. Vice Mayor Talt? Here. Mayor Jacobowski? Here. Councilmember Wong? Here. Great. Thank you. The agenda is posted 72 hours prior to each regular meeting at the following locations. City Hall, the Crawl Public Library, and the Stoneman Building. The agenda is also posted on the city's website. Uh, before we move forward, um, I believe the city manager has an announcement, Dr. Marlowe. I do indeed, Mayor. Good morning, I come to you with my face, uh, not behind a mask. I just want to make the official announcement. I'm sure that the community is well aware that Los Angeles County Public Health has issued a new health order that changes the masking requirements at facilities uh, discretion. Um, the new health order says that facilities have the option of making the mask policy optional rather than mandatory, as long as the people taking their masks off are fully vaccinated and verified to be fully vaccinated. This is different from the blip in time that we experienced last summer where we also got to take our masks off where the health order permitted self-attestation or the honor system this health order does not do that <laughs> does not permit us to accept self-attestation uh, does not accept the honor system and in fact requires us to verify vaccination status or a negative COVID test we have sent some messaging out into the community. We also have had some internal discussion with staff and you've seen some of the protocols in place today. We know that everybody is very eager to take their masks off. <laughs> and so given this opportunity, uh, we had some long discussion about what did we wanna do about this? Because of course it creates challenges for staff to now have to ask for vaccinations it potentially puts staff in an awkward position with people that don't want to provide it and yet having to enforce the masking for those that don't provide it. But on balance, we wanted to give the employees and the community the opportunity to remove their masks if they were so eligible. So we did that. And I do just want to say, as always, San Marino is carving out its own path. Most of our neighboring cities, it was confirmed for me yesterday, are not doing what we are doing. They, in fact, are leaving the mandatory masking in place because of how difficult it will be to enforce it. So uh, just a heads up to the community, please be patient with staff. If you come into one of our facilities and get asked for information, it is not our rule, it is the county's rule. Uh, and so we are just following that. So happy to see you all fully this morning. And just for the community's uh, benefit, you are uh, being asked the same thing that everyone is. Thank you to all council members who did verify their status as well. Uh, we are all law abiding professionals. Thank you so much, Mayor. Thank you, it is nice to see your smile. The city welcomes public input. At this time, the public may address the city council on items that are not on the agenda. Pursuant to state law, the city council may not discuss or take action on issues not on the meeting agenda. To ensure that everyone, including those joining us remotely, are able to hear the speakers clearly, uh, we don't have to be as emphatic about this in most cases, but please speak clearly into the microphone. Uh, all comments are limited to two minutes and will be uh, timed by city staff. Um, I would now like to ask City Clerk Baker to explain how public comment works. Thank you, Mayor. For each item on the agenda, there will be time for public comment. We'll accept comments in three ways. First, we will take in-person comments for each item. Please fill out a speaker card and turn it into me if you wish to speak on an item. There is a countdown timer to the left of the public microphone to help speakers keep track of the remaining time to speak. Next, we will then ask for comments from our Zoom participants. When we ask for public comments via Zoom, there are two ways you can let us know you would like to speak. First, you can use the raised hand feature, which is a button that's found by clicking on participants and then clicking on raised hand on the bottom right side of the screen. Please do not use this feature until we have asked for public comment or else we may not see it or know which item you're asking to speak on. As a second option, you can send a message using the chat box saying you would like to speak on this particular agenda item. Comments will be accepted only until the end of the public comment period for that item. 
Finally, I will then read into the, pub, into the record any public comments received by email for that particular item. Due to technical limitations associated with gathering, printing, and sorting emailed public comment, the city has instituted a 3 p.m. cutoff the day before Friday city council meetings for emailed public comments. This is to ensure there's sufficient time to gather and present the emailed comments at the city council meeting. Any comments received after 3 p.m. the day before our Friday city council meeting will be included in the public comment record, but, but will not be read at the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anyone present wishing to speak at this time? We do. Mr. Korn? Good morning, Council. Did you say I could remove my mask? Certainly. Oh, okay. If you have provided <laughs> your... <laughs> my wife's my wife very immunocompromised, so... Lovely way to begin. I got a word for this. Uh, I bring news from uh, the Metro Board meeting from yesterday. Uh, I think Director Throne probably knows all of this already, but I thought I would tell you. Yesterday, they voted, they UNAS passed a notion, a motion to change the rules of funding. As you recall, we were restricted only car-centric projects. They had to increase traffic flow of cars alone and nothing else. But now they've changed it. They now uh, are broadening it to buses, bikes, and pedestrian safety. That opens the door for us to utilize those funds. Now, if you recall, uh, we declined three of the five projects, totaling about $22 million that were withdrawn from our allocation. And we're the only city to do that. They are now, I, I, I spoke at this meeting and I said, please, if to make it equal, if you're gonna allow other cities to change their minds and change the project, you need to allow us to do the same thing. And you need to reallocate to San Reno the $22 million. So I propose that we act on that. I furthermore ask, that because we're a small city, we don't have a Department of Transportation, we don't have a huge staff of a Department of Public Works, that they allow us to spend, the, measure our money for traffic engineering consultations and studies so that we can develop very good programs specific to us. And um, it levels the playing field with other larger cities. So I would ask city council to have a formal communication with the Metro board including Catherine Barger, who's on the board and was there and heard me speak and direct um, uh, public works to implement these changes of getting the money back and uh, uh, pursuing that we get money for studies. Thank you very much. And thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak here? I have no other requests for comment at this time. Okay, thank you. And do we have um, anyone wishing to speak who's online? No, no requests from Zoom either. Okay, thank you. Um, at this point, point, I would like to propose that we hear items two and three from the regular meeting and item one from the special meeting prior to the other items. Um, they do have a bit of a tie-in. So why don't we start um, with item number two, um, approval to amend citywide financial policies. And may we start with a presentation from Director Chung, please. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor and City Council members. If you could get the PowerPoint up, that'd be great, thank you. So this morning, City Council, I will be presenting a staff's recommendation to amend the citywide financial policies. This is a accumulation of conversations with uh, many conversations with the finance liaisons and the city treasurer as well, regards to coming to you, regards to this uh, recommendation. This morning, um, I'm recommending that we uh, consider updating two sections of our fiscal policy, section 1A, which there's two components. First one is uh, potentially lowering our general fund reserves from 40% to 30%. And I'll go into more detail regards to why um, staff's recommending this change. Uh, we, also, we are also asking for your consideration to add additional general fund operating reserves of 1.25% um, to the fiscal policy. Uh, this was an item that the Strategic Financial Planning Committee had um, recommended um, back in 2018. We just never added it 
um, to our fiscal policy. Uh, so I'm asking if we, we can add that language to our fiscal policy for section 1A. And then the second uh, portion is section 1D um, to add language for periodic transfers from accumulated general fund reserves to pay down unfunded pension or OPEP liabilities. So basically this doesn't mean that um, council will be required to uh, do these contributions. It's more just to add language that um, council can consider um, doing uh, funding these uh, unfunded liabilities uh, if, if funds are available. So the focus for my presentation will mainly be why we want to move the reserve from 40 to 30%. Um, in the staff report, I provide a, a table in detail. And I, I also wanted to mention, thank you, uh, City Treasurer. I believe she's on Zoom. She mentioned to me that on page 14 of table one, um, there was a minor um, uh, uh, error that I made. It said less 30% reserve balance for fiscal year policy. It should have said less 40% because the calculation was correct. It was based on 40%. It was just a minor typo on my part. It should have said 40, not 30%. So I wanted to let the council know on that. Um, but regards to what the uh, amount will look like if we were to lower from 40 to 30%, um, as you are aware, council come, I, I come to council every year regards to our surplus or our, our net income um, at the end of the year for the council to consider to move to the CIP fund. Um, this year, when we ended our last fiscal year this year, I'll be coming to council in March regards to what that looks like. Currently at 40%, our current policy level, it'll be $3.4 million. But if we were to lower it down to 30%, that will be bumped up close to approximately 3 million to $6.4 million. And so why, why is this important? Um, I believe that there's just really two reasons why it's important. It's really return on our investments and um, in lieu and making our money work for the community based versus putting aside and gaining late interest. Um, and the importance I believe is the CIP infrastructure that we're, we will be investing into regards to the additional funding that, that city council can uh, move the funds to. And also the ability to pay down various um, obligations such as the pension and, and OPEB liabilities. Uh, versus, as I mentioned, LAIF, which has been earning less than 1%. So if I go back to that example of this $3 million increase, if council was to approve the lowering the reserve from 40 to 30%, LAIF, if we were to keep it in LAIF, that extra $3 million would have earned us $30,000 in that year versus spending that additional $3 million and putting it into an inf a bigger infrastructure project or even paying down some of our uh, liabilities. Um, I think that would be a better return on our investment than just keeping that cash on the bank. Um, just wanted to show the city council what city council has done in the past prior years regards to our capital project fund and the contributions we've made. And so in fiscal year 1718 was when our first fiscal policy was implemented, uh, when the 40% reserve was set, uh, council moved $15.1 million to the capital fund. And then the following uh, two years later, $5 million and then another $3 million. So to date, we've contributed $23 million to the capital fund. And then of course, council has a, um, another opportunity on the March 9th meeting to either move $3.4 million if we keep the reserve at 40 or increase that by to $6.4 million if we were to reserve, lower the reserve to 30%. Uh, another uh, top, reason why I believe that uh, lowering to 40 to 30 percent makes sense is I look towards GFOA, the gold standards of how they set uh, reserve levels and best practices. And they quote, regardless of size, maintain unrestricted budgetary fund balance in their general fund or no less than two months of regular general fund operating reserve revenues or regular general fund operating expenditures. So what that really means is that um, they're recommending that we keep at least two months worth of expenditures to pay for that day of rainy day comes. Um, and if the current 40% actually keeps us at close to 5.4 months worth of expenditures that we keep uh, on the side to, to for that rainy day. But if we were to lower that to 30%, it would be four months worth of expenditure. So we're still doubling what the best practice GFOA is requiring us. A comparison that I wanted to also show to the council is just various other cities as well. San Marino, of course, um, being at 40%, uh, 
um, is at the highest. Um, it's uncommon to see such a high uh, reserve level. But if we were to even lower it down to 30%, we'll still be at the same level as uh, Hill, uh, Hillsboro, which is up north, but also South Pass at 30%. Some of the other local cities I've seen was 25 and down to 17% for some of the other cities. Um, the reason that cities don't keep a high reserve, there's many reasons, but um, main driver, of course, is looking at the GFOA uh, standard and and they don't want to keep cash on the side. They want to make that cash work for the community. And so that's why they, they try to keep their reserves lower than keeping higher reserves and keeping that in the bank. Another emphasis I wanted to um, uh, bring to the city council is that during this COVID, the last two and a half years, many agencies actually stop their CIP infrastructure projects because of revenues dried up. Also, some cities actually lowered their reserves because they're, they weren't able to cover their operating costs. Also, some many cities actually have opened bonds such as pension obligation bonds to pay for their expenditures. For San Marino, we didn't do any of that. Uh, we actually had the highest cash on, the, on hand, historically, the highest CIP fund balance on hand. And also our pension obligation bond will be paid off in two years, no additional debt. So we are physically, fiscally in a very strong position as you are aware. And um, for me, it makes sense for us to think about or reconsider our reserve at this point versus me coming to the council when things are not looking good and saying we need to lower this to cover our expenses. That's not the case here. It's more of taking advantage of our current fi financial situation and utilizing funds um, and moving that fund potentially to, to invest that money um, for capital um, or unfunded liabilities. Last slide I have for the council is just to summarize what I just covered regards to what the benefits are when we look at 30% versus 40%. As I mentioned, the surplus will be $6.4 million at 30% versus $3.4 million at 40%. The CIP fund balance, if we were to add that six, you know, the, the surplus to this current CIP fund balance, you're looking at $23.4 million at a 30% level versus 40% at $20.4 million. Um, the investment returns, if we were to um, take that extra $3 million, as I mentioned on that surplus side, and if we were to invest some of that into a 115 trust, um, then we could be earning 4 4 to 7% on that money too as well, versus just keeping that $3 million, as I mentioned, in LAIF, which would be um, accumulating less than 1%. Also, I believe that this uh, reserve policy is more flexible at 30%, meaning the current policy states that the minimum requirement is 40 to maintain 40% reserves. That means we just can't dip below that 40%. But if we were to lower the reserve down to 30%, that's the minimum reserve requirement, meaning we can always keep a higher reserve and set it at 40% if we want to, or the city council wants to. It's just that gives, in my opinion, a more flexibility to be at that lower 30%, but we don't have to keep it at that 30%. We can always keep more. And lastly, as I mentioned, at the 30% level, our monthly expenses, we can cover four months worth at a 30% level versus if we keep it at the 40 current percent, at 40%, that'll be about 5.3 months worth of expenditures. So with that said, um, that concludes my presentation. I'm available for any questions from the council. Thank you. Thank you for that detailed offering. Uh, questions, uh, Councilwoman Shepard Romy, do you have questions for Director Chung? Um, uh, yes, I do. Uh, part of my problem with considering this today is that I don't know, and we haven't, um, or I haven't seen the long-term capital expenditure schedule for those projects, which I understand we have a lot of significant ones um, in our future and how that's impacted perhaps if the public safety tax is not passed when it is coming up in a few years. Um, so when will such a schedule or information be available to myself and my council members, as well as the general public, so we have a better understanding of what the next five to 10 years um, looks like in terms of expenditures? Um, I believe that schedule, if correct me if I'm wrong, city manager, that it would be for the CIP budget meeting in April 9th, 14th? March, sorry, yeah. March, March 14th meeting, 18th. <laughs> March 18th meeting, yes. It'll be available for, for um, on that day. Um, also last year, of course, during the budget process, we 
we provided the council regards to that five year uh, CIP program as well. Um, it, it, of course, depending upon what council decides today and the priority initiatives, of course, that number changes, but that was um, kind of the plan last year as well. And then, of course, anything that we add to today. All right. Yes, that helps me. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Not at this time. Thank you. Um, let's see, Council Member Huang. Yes, can you go back to that uh, four to seven percent investment return? How'd you uh, how'd you come up with that number? Uh, yes. So that basically that number is just if we were to set aside the next item that I'm presenting to the City Council is a trust. For instance, last year we opened up our SERP where we uh, seeded half a million dollars to open up that 115 trust that has earned us a little over 7% return in that year that we've had it in that trust. So what I meant here that four to 7% is if we were to um, take some of that surplus money and set aside to a 115 trust, then it will earn that four to 7% interest. Okay. And um um, is there any other city that has higher reserve um, at 40% than us? Um, you know, when, when Mark and I looked at this, uh, we didn't come across anyone that was above the 30%. Um, but the, the intricacies of that is there's also some cities have rainy day funds and it, so that they potentially have higher, but the actual <laughs> policies, the beyond the 30%, we didn't come across. There could be some, but... It's, it's rare for us to see anything up in that 40% level. Um, is there any city on that list at less than 30% that is more phys uh, phys fiscally sound than our city? Uh, fiscally sound. I would say, I would say Hillsborough looking at, I haven't mm -hmm. looked at their recent financials, but that's a great benchmark city. They're, they're as you know, a single family oriented uh, community. Um, their finances is relatively similar to us, meaning their structure of revenues, property taxes, their main revenue. I would say it's Hillsborough. Um, but then other than that, Pasadena is so complex and they've been hit so hard with COVID. I would say the rest of the cities have been impacted by COVID quite a bit versus Hillsborough, even COVID or not, they've been in a very stable fiscal condition. And um, do we have any problem with uh, the current 40%? I would, um, when you say, I could maybe elaborate I mean, on. No, I mean my, my, you know, I mean my question is kind of like, if is uh, if there's no problem, why fix it? That's my question. That's actually, it's it's really more of a policy question. Um, we don't have any catastrophe that stems from having a forty percent reserve, but if you free up that extra ten percent, it does mean that we could invest more in infrastructure if you were interested. Um, I remember back then uh, when I was on the long-term financial complaint committee, I asked um, Director Thorn back then that if we have the capacity to handle more, uh, you know, uh, for example, for paving the roads, and he said, no, this is the most that we can handle at that time. I don't know about now. Well, Maybe that, we have more uh, help after COVID. Questions? That you, question, is, that is, question. Are there any questions of Director Thorn? Because mm -hmm. I think you start getting into a dialogue. Okay. Anyway, so um, is there any other? Uh, I mean, is there any disadvantage of um, moving it to thirty percent? I don't. I don't see it as a disadvantage. Um, I was trying to understand why we set it at forty percent from the beginning. I, I'm not sure. I, I believe it was just a starting point because that was the first time a policy regards to reserves were set. Um, but there was no rationale behind that forty percent to at least to my research that I could find. So for me, I believe that it lowering it to 30% just gives us that more flexibility than okay. 40%. No more questions, thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor Tom? Can I ask questions? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't realize you were here today. Council and I have member. a follow up as well. Um, okay, we'll go all the way around then we'll come back. Okay, I'm sorry, Council Member Yudi. Uh, Director Chang, these couple questions, because you know we, we get revenue and we have expenses, and then we either have an operating profit or an operating loss. So reducing from 40 to 30, I'm going to ask a few questions about the stability of our revenue and the predictability of our expenses. So when you look at our revenue over time, has it been increasing or stable or decreasing? No, it's, it's been increasing. Uh, because our re re main revenue source is property tax, and as you know, that is a very stable, it, it, property tax is the gold standard of any agency regards to stable revenues. 
easy to forecast, easy to predict than others. Um, we, the San Marino has been growing at four, between four to 6% the last five years. And yeah. it's predicted to continue to be at that trend. And what percentage of our revenue is property taxes? Uh, close seventy percent. Okay. Okay. Have you seen any surprises on revenue that uh, have concerned you? Uh, not on the concern side, but we I forecasted five percent this year. Uh, so far, year to date, what we collect on property tax is close to four percent. So it is a little shy of one percent, which is not an alarm to go off. I am waiting eagerly, waiting for our March payment, which is going to be a considerable property tax payment in April to see because last year too, we were trailing and then we got a very large, I believe it was close to some 40% increase year over year that we saw for that particular month payment. So Mark and I anticipate that big increase to next uh, in the next two payments from property taxes. That's the only kind of item that flagged me regards to okay. looking at that closely. And, and when you look at our expenses, how predictable are they? Um, looking out to the out years, I would say it's a little difficult because of inflation, as you have been hearing and seeing in regards to inflation, how is that going to impact us as an organization next year? Um, I've been seeing regards to utilities but increasing quite what, a bit. What, what percentage of our expenses are personnel, payroll? Uh, personnel, I believe that's close to... 70, 65 percent. It's close, right, so, almost to the revenue. So, so that's property. not going to be impacted directly by by inflation. No. no. May, may, our main expense, of course, is services, which is personnel, yeah. which is mostly our budget. And when you look historically at our, uh, you know, the uh, the operating profit or the excesses, what has that kind of typically been, and has has that been stable? It's it's been stable. What I've been seeing is three million to three point five million, okay. and we also have that ARPA money that we collect. You know, half of that this year, we have another 1.5 million coming in uh, in our new fiscal have, year. Have we ever dipped into the, the reserve? Have we ever had to dip into the reserve? And, uh, to my knowledge, no, we've never dipped into that. We've actually had such a high reserve in the past that uh, we, to my knowledge, we never dipped into that reserve. All right. So I kind of some that, so you see very, you see essentially zero risk if we would go to 20%. I wouldn't say there's not, I don't think anything in life is 0%, but um, even at 20, I, I, even at 20%, uh, I would, I wouldn't feel, I wouldn't be able to go to sleep at night comfortably at 20%. That's just my honest opinion. But at 40%, even at 30%, um, just from my research, just looking at how we are looking fiscally for the next year, couple of years, I do feel confident that we have less risk lowering this 40 okay. to 30%, but 20% is a different uh, conversation and then so going from 40 to 30 would move three and a half million into the opportunity fund that we could invest it'll in be three million but or, yes yeah, but three million the city things we could consider. invest back into the city yes okay thank you thank you vice mayor talk thank you mayor um I, i'm making an assumption and tell me this is correct when we started this reserve uh fund it has always been in, intended to cover 5.8 months uh, of expenditures because it's based upon a percentage or when we started it was it intended to cover a greater period. No, was... So we didn't have a cap until 2018. When no, I understand. Okay. And that committee uh, made the determination at 40% because I, I think that that was the comfort level given that we were starting from no cap and we were somewhere around 82% of revenue and 40% seemed like a comfortable gut check going from 82%, but it was not based on any number of set operating months. Okay, and, was, and I appreciate that, please. I, I appreciate that that doesn't answer my question. Mm -hmm. When If we go back and take a look at the number, that 40%, was intended to cover five point, or, or actually covered five point eight uh, months, or was because it's a percentage of a certain thing, more like six months. It was not intended to cover any number of months. Okay, what that, did it cover? What did the forty percent oh. cover? So that what, what what does the forty percent yeah. cover? It covers when, a when five. We first, when we first started it, has it always been five point eight months or? It's five point three, but yes, it, at forty percent, it covers five point three months okay. worth then, of so expenditure. So that's forty percent of the year. Yes. Okay. Yes. Why 
30%? Why not 35%? Why not 32.5%? Why the, a 25% reduction? I think that's a great question, council member. Uh, that's a question that the finance liaison and myself and also city treasurer had conversations. Why do we, what's that 30% level? You know, why not 25% or, or 35%? I don't have a, a straight answer or clear answer. It's just that when I looked at it, it made sense that it covers four months worth of expenditures. Um, it's relatively uh, similar to what other cities also keep. Um, I felt that also it's that $3 million uh, of the surplus money that can potentially be moved to the CIP fund. So I think there's just various other, I think there, there was no real uh, formula regards to why we nailed it down to 30%. With the increase in the uh, return on investment, what happens to that return? Where does it go? That just goes back to the general fund. Every year we budget any- So this is a way to increase general fund, the investment. Can, can, we, can, can we tie the return of investment to require it to go someplace other than the general fund? To go into so so let me let me clarify uh, when you're asking the, the the interest that we were to earn yeah the interest that, we, that we, four we to seven percent let, let me restate it again mm -hmm. so it's it's evident the reasons that i've heard is that there is to be a larger return on it uh, on our investment we only get life in one and we get a larger return in the other mm -hmm. What happens to that larger return? Where does it go? Does it file back into the CIP budget? Does it go into reserve? Does it go, is there some place that it's specifically tied to? So I would say if we were to move this $3 million instead of keeping it on in our, in our bank and in life, if we were to, to move this 3 million additional money by lowering our reserve from 40 to 30%, there's two things that it will do. One is reinvest that into our infrastructure, CIP projects. That doesn't have an actual dollar interest tied to that. But the other component would be if we were to take that $3 million and put aside and open up a 115 trust and set that money aside, that will in earn interest. And that interest that we earn will be kept in that 115 trust until we want to dip into that um, 115 trust to reimburse the city back for some expenses. Hopefully that answers your it, it It does to a, to a great degree, and I appreciate mm -hmm. that. But in the resolution, does it tie where the where, where that 25 percent of what we previously reserved will go? Does it say it's going to go into a trust? Does it say it's going to go into uh, uh, some specific fund, or does it just say it's going to sit in general? I don't believe that the resolution states that it's okay. going to go to a specific. Okay, yeah. I have no further questions. Okay, I have uh, just a few myself. So um, that was really helpful, having the comparison of the other cities with their reserves. Um, were you able to ascertain, and if not, I understand, I know you did a lot of work on this, um, if any of these other cities have similar capital improvement project budgets or allocations like we have? I, I did not look at that, no. Okay, and you don't know anecdotally where anybody's at, do you? You just kind of looking at the size of the city uh, and from what I've kind of heard, I, I attended the CSMFO conference last weekend, last week, and, and the conversation uh, was about how to spend some of this ARPA money, but they were also talking about CIP projects. And, and it seems like the larger cities, let's say, for instance, Pasadena, of course, their CIP is a very large portion of their budget. Um, I know that most of these cities are open beginning back their their CIP programs because many of them froze their programs but with that to answer your question um, to compare to what um, the size of the reserve that I don't know that answer okay yeah that's fine thank you um, okay so then I think there are some additional questions uh, councilwoman Shepard Romy you wanted to ask something 
I, I did. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Sure. Um, following up on the slide, can we, uh, not the one about the cities, but had uh, that you raised, uh, brought back for uh, Council Member Wong that had the two, the comparison. Thank you. This, no. This one. The first one you just briefly had <laughs> on there. I know it's the next slide, but it won't go to the next It's not slide. cooperating. It worked the first yeah, here, two times. Hold on. Here we go. It, that one. Yes. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yes. Um, I too was, or I'm curious and wanted to know this amount of investment returns of 30 versus 40, mm -hmm. is, is there a reason you're, you're factoring in on the screen four to 7% based upon those monies being invested in the trust? That's where you're getting the data for that. Yes. So the 3.4, or I'm sorry, what's the difference? 3 million. Mm -hmm that is going to now be potentially in the 30 percent 3% 30% if we reduce it would be 3 million higher but all of that money that 3 million is not going to go in even if today's two the next two agenda items it would be 1.1 million um, that would be earning such a return you're absolutely right. So one third of it would actually get a higher return. The remaining money, yes. the vast majority of it will still be at our less than 1% or whatever the current life, um, which is basically what that 1% is yes. a, an approximation of. Am I correct in that? Yes, council member, you're absolutely right. Okay. So that's not really representative of our investment returns. As a matter of fact, that's only one third of our investment return. Yes, yes. Okay. And then... The monthly expense coverage, I was also curious, and that's something that council, or I'm sorry, Vice Mayor Talt brought up. Um, back when we first discussed where to target our reserves in our city, um, coming into this as a, as a new council, some of us, and getting the recommendation of that long-term committee, the recommendation was quite high, higher than 20%. I don't think that was ever on the table. I don't remember if it was 30, 40, or 50, but we were trying to establish something. And I know, do you have, or when you said um, in your staff report that you returned and spoke with some of the prior long-term advisors, what was their specific recommendation as to what is going on right now? And um, if you will, their guesstimate of the best future course in percentage in setting aside or whether we should be changing this? The overall conversation was the words no brainer. I mean, I'm quoting the conversation was used, meaning it made sense that lowering the 40 down to 30% made fiscal sense to contribute that additional money into CIP or elsewhere than just kind of keeping that money aside in the bank. The long-term committee said that yes the three the, we had three members um join us in our conversation and that um it was overall that was a consensus from that meeting right with staff and council members here etc or do you mean i'm asking specifically of the long range um professionals uh, yes it, it was from the uh the, the committee the three members and, and I could point, maybe I'll be look glad towards to the finances. Not be interrupted. It's so rude what's going on here. I am happy to hear from Director Chung, and I respect what's going on, and I'm actually looking forward to hearing from him. Okay. I'm simply trying to clarify. My apologies. Please go forward. I've heard this from you and Council Member Yudi, and really, I know that this is painful, but I need to hear it from him. I okay. I think I heard you, and I offered you my apology. Thank you. I'm sorry, Director Chung. I, I'm just trying to understand what those people, and you were in the midst of telling me who was there from the original committee or how many? Uh, three members were there uh, in that meeting. Thank you. Yes. I have no further questions. I have a follow-up question. Uh, let me go back in our okay. order, okay? Uh, Council Member Huang, any follow-up questions? Uh, no, thank you, ma'am. Okay, Council Member Yudi? Uh, Director Chung. Uh, Going from 40 to 30 just frees up about $3 million, correct? Yes. 
Because I don't, I, I view the freeing up into 3 million as an independent event from the investment return. It's just freeing up 3 million that then council can decide what we're gonna do with that. Is that correct? Yes. We could either invest it into a trust. Yes. Or we could put it into CIP. Yes. Okay. So, you know, for, for council, I, I think it's, an, I, I believe that that is a confusing uh, line on, on that schedule. What we're really talking about is, do we wanna go from 40 to 30 and free up another $3 million that we can either invest into a trust or we can invest back to, into the city some other way. To quote a other council member, we're in the position of asking questions right okay. now. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Vice Mayor Tall? I have no further questions. Okay. Um, I have one last question. Can you go back again to the recent long term? small group that met and what was their specific charge specific charges and what why did they meet wh why did we meet uh we wanted to just get their um their input regards to the thought process behind the going lowering the reserve from 40 to 30 percent and tr just trying to get ideas of does this make sense is this a, a, a prudent thing to do moving forward. Okay, thank you. So at this point, I'd like to open it up for public comments. Uh, is there anyone here who wishes to speak on this item? Seeing none, um, is there anyone online who would like to comment? I'm not seeing any requests for comment on this item. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to bring the item back to council for discussion. Do I have any comments or questions or Further discussion from council? Councilwoman Shepard Romy. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have to say that in my mind, it's not prudent to make any changes in this regard at this time. Um, to me, there is no need to reduce the general fund reserves um, because we don't have more CIP projects in the pipeline that need funding. And we do not have a full schedule yet or um, an understanding of what the next five to seven years will be um, anticipating. And also, we have some additional major costs there. I know that we have requests to do major revisions to the police department structurally. We have some large expenses coming in public works, um, as well as continuing. And I believe our costs of even managing the city day to day are ever increasing. Um, I understand the point about personnel, but in the next five to seven years, we're going to be making additional capital investments that are currently running at least 20, if not more percent above anticipated costs. So we have things skyrocketing because of COVID and we're definitely entering in on certain times in terms of inflation and returns on investments, whether you are in the markets or in uh, more financially conservative investments, which our city must be. Um, and all of those things will be a bumpy road, I think, in the next couple of years. And I do not think anybody in this room can really predict. And since these are taxpayer funds, monies, and we are a city that must provide services in difficult times, we were lucky that this was something COVID was something that our city weathered well because of vaccinations and our efforts and city staff doing their best to keep our city safe and our residents safe. But um, another disaster like earthquake or who knows what um, could be devastating. So um, I think for all of those reasons and for public safety and security, we should keep it at 40% and there's no need to change it now in a pretty uncertain time financially for our community and our country. Even if we have the money, we don't have necessarily, or I don't see the need to spend it um, in other ways or keep it in a trust that's locked away for something else. So those are my thoughts on this. Um, thank you. Okay, council member Huang. Uh, yes, I agree with my colleague, council member Shikoromi. And, um, and when I was on the long-term financial committee, that was only 2018, four years ago. So back then we, you know, we planned this long term. So I don't think we should change at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor Tall. 
You skipped yeah. council member Yudi again. <laughs> again. What is my problem today? <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> it's every day. <laughs> Let's go back to council member Yudi. Thank you. No, this is uh, clearly one I feel pretty passionate about, probably more passionate than any other thing that's come before us. Um, I was on that long-term financial planning uh, committee four or five years ago. Um, and that's the reason why I ran for council because I didn't think the city was looking after its capital pro programs. We learned at that time that if we had good streets, it would cost seven to $800,000 a year to keep good streets good. And council ignored the streets and now we're facing 40 to 50 million dollars to get the streets back up to what they should be and we have a lot of other major capital improvement programs you know on our uh horizon with the police department public works lacey park san marino center all kinds of things to reinvest back into the community i i believe that our revenues are very predictable i believe our expenses are very manageable and predictable um and that freeing up this $3 million to reinvest back into the city is what the residents would want. If we just keep it in the bank, we're wasting money um, or wasting opportunity. Um, and I think this city, the community deserve us to put it back to work, you know, back to work for, for trees, for Lacey Park, for sidewalks, for sewers, for police, uh, cars for police station for you know things that will work for the community and if we leave that money in the bank we're just wasting an opportunity to uh, to move things forward and if we had a major earthquake or any other major disaster that's what capital improvements are for they they would cut, cut, that would be be available to to reinvest back and repair things so I think uh, we should and also the when the long term committee said forty percent. We, I recall we just grabbed a number because there was no cap before. So we just grabbed a number as a starting point. And we pulled together Jay Goldstein, who led that group, Mark, Mark Holdsworth, that's a very savvy investor, John Chow, and we sampled it. And as Director Chung said, it was, quote, a no brainer to go from 40 to, to, to 30, knowing that even 20 would be a very safe, uh, safe number to go to. So I would encourage council to open up their. Uh, their, their minds and uh, let's put this money back to work for the community. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, a reserve fund is not for purposes of a return on investment. It is a, a safety net. Um, and uh, while I agree we should put the the money we do have to its best use and get its best return. My fear or, or, or the problem that I'm having it as drafted right now is it doesn't prescribe for us the resolution, the reasons why we should do it. And by that, I mean, it's not that, that we're gonna take that extra 25% that we will have of this reserve fund and put it in a trust where it could earn more uh, money and yet also do something uh, uh, to, to, to protect th that, that is security related. I think there's a better idea to put our money to use. Um, and, and I just, and even the, the 30 to 40% bothers me. If it was 35%, I might be more open to it, but the reserve fund is there not to earn interest. We're fortunate we do. It's for, it's for the safety and security so that we don't get into another situation where we have to fire everybody in which to survive. So I, am, I support this idea, but just not the way it's, it's put together right now. All done? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm normally quite predictable on these types of matters and this is no exception. Um, our finance director supports this, but equally important to me, this is a GFA OA supported um, practice, 16 to 17%, up to 20. So uh, the GFOA is proposing a maximum of 20. We have six other cities that are at 30 or below. I suspect if we checked around, we would see how solid we are as a city both with our property tax and our capital improvement money that we've set aside. 
Um, obviously, I agree with Councilman Udy. When I first came on council, I got lots of phone calls with complaints about the roads, the sidewalks, and the uh, condition of the city. Um, I still get lots of phone calls, but they are not about those issues. And I think that's the result of a robust program that has been put in place. We thank Director Throne for that. Um, we are so fortunate to get 70% of our budget from property tax. And if the sky started to fall, we could certainly make an emergency ordinance to adjust this. So I think this is best practices and um, I would support it. Do I have a motion? I move to adopt resolution number R-22-05 amending the citywide financial policies. I'll second. Roll call, please. Council Member Wong? Uh, no. Council Member Shepard Rami? No. Council Member Udy? Yes. Vice Mayor Tult? No. Mayor Jacobowski? Yes. Motion does not pass. Thank you. Mayor, there are other changes to the fiscal policy. So if the council was so inclined to offer a motion to adopt the resolution with the exception of maintaining the reserve at 40%, that would take care of the other changes that Director Chung indicated. If you have no motion, then none of the changes get made. Well, I would like to move to continue this so that we could see what, if, if that's the case, whether than the, the move to, uh, I'm not exactly sure what you want us to do, but I would be considered to continue us to come back with a uh, lesser amount to be taken out of the reserves uh, and also to specifically highlight in the resolution where the difference is going to go. Okay, we can do that. So moved. I, you don't, you probably don't need a motion for that. I can take that direction oh, okay. and do that. Okay, thank you. You'll excuse me for hopefully only a moment. Of course. Okay, so then we are moving on to item number one, approval of annual $100,000 contribution to the C um, California Employees Retirement Benefit Trust. And may we have a presentation, please, um, for this item and... Uh, I'm sorry, item number yes. one is... Net is item number seven? May I offer? Or are we going to number two, or which is yes. now three? So, uh, apologies for the confusion. We, <laughs> we, dropped the same the, page. We, we dropped the item when we published the agenda. So what we'd like to do now is take the two trust items together. So that's item number one from your special agenda. Oh. <laughs> and then item number three from your regular agenda. Thank you. We are so sorry. So both. Yes, so finance, and yes. So and finance the... director Chung will present it together. And then um, we will offer you a combined motion should you be so inclined we to. Okay, oh, fantastic. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. Uh, could we get that? Thank you. So uh, I'll be presenting both the combined uh, SEP and SERP. So SEP, the way I, I know the acronyms are very similar in nature, but the way I, I try to remember it is the word SEP kind of has that P sound as for the pension side. And then the SERP is for the OPEB. Um, that's just the way I delineate it in my mind because I get those two uh, acronyms convoluted in my mind. Um, so today, this morning, I'll just present in two pieces, the SEP portion and what this is for and why um, I'm recommending this council to open a, a SEP program with CalPERS and fund it with a million dollar contribution, a one-time contribution. And then move on to the SERP, uh, the Employer's Retirement Benefit Trust that we already have open and see if city council wants to consider contributing $100,000 annual for the next four fiscal years. I also have CalPERS on the line. So if you have questions, um, we can always uh, ask Matt from CalPERS questions regards to the, the two programs. Um, and with that said, when not, the presentation format is, I'll start with the SEP and then pause there to give the council ability to ask questions on the SEP, and then I'll finish with the SERP. So let me begin with the SEP. Regards to the SEP, um, this is for the pension side. And currently we have 60 classic members um, and 48 PEPRA members. Uh, what that means is uh, back when the pension got reformed, uh, it moved from, from what we call classic to a PEPRA formula that made agencies, uh, it, it became the form, the pension program became more affordable with the reform. 
but it takes time for that, the classing members to eventually retire and then the PEPRA program to eventually take over. So with that said, um, the graph uh, on the right side basically shows the, the increases in our liability on the pension side as, as it continues to increase and it will increase for the pop, it, approximately for the next 15 years until most of the classic members have retired and then the PEPRA comes on board and we'll see a decrease in our liability as we move forward. In our budget, we annually um, put aside $4.3 million for our payments for our pension costs. Uh, half of it is for the employer portion and then half of it, the other half is for the UAL or the unfunded actuarial liability portion of that. Um, as we ended the fiscal year, last fiscal year, our uh, unfunded liability sat at $35.7 million. So why the SEP program? Um, it really has four benefits. Uh, number one, it has high yielding uh, investments. It also gives the city ability to compound and earn that interest. It also reduces our unfunded liabilities and our future contributions. Number three, improves our financial reporting um, ability. And lastly, it's, uh, it's affordable. It's 25 basis points. Just wanted to show the city council uh, what that compounding would look like if we were to seed uh, a one-time $1 million to open up this fund. And if it was to grow at 6.21%, where I get that number is, is what CalPERS is, is strategically stating that if we choose um, a certain strategy, which is more of the, um, uh, the lesser risky strategy, they only have two strategies. If we were to choose a less risky strategy, we will earn um, this $1 million would be close to approximately $365,000 of earned interest in the next five years versus if we were to keep this in LAFE and um, if, if it was earning less than 1% or about 1%, we would have only earned $50,000 in this five-year period. This is a, a, a spread, uh, a slide from CalPERS, um, just kind of showing the city council the various benefits uh, of opening up this trust. Um, the left, the first column, the CalPERS pension, that's if the city was to directly um, agree with CalPERS that we were gonna pay down our unfunded liability. Um, it has the higher return, but yet has higher risk, meaning we lose the control, the liquidity. It's an agreement with CalPERS saying that we're going to spend X amount of dollars every year for the next um, 10, 15 years, whatever the agreement is set, and that we don't get to pull that money out. It just pays into that unfunded liability. That is not the option I'm recommending to the council. What I'm recommending to the council is to open up the 115 trust. It's the two columns in the middle either strategy one or two. Strategy one is more of the higher um, expected return, but has higher risk. Strategy two is what I'm recommending and also uh, city treasurer also agrees is that it's a lesser um, return, but yet also has less re risk. And then lastly, if we of course don't open up the trust and just keep that $1 million, then we'll be earning the LAFE rate. This slide here just is from straight from CalPERS, just shows the different strategy and where the strategy one and two gets invested into to earn that interest. Um, strategy one, of course, has higher equities, of course, comes with more risk. Strategy two has less equities, more fixed income, hence it's more stable, uh, brings in a little less um, return, but also is very stable to flatline the market volatility, as you've been seeing on, in the financial markets recently with, um, with the volatility volatility there. Um, just the risk to consider for council, uh, similar to what, when we opened up our SERP program last year, the risk is that the IRS Section 115 Trust is irrevocable. Once we open it and we move this fund in, um, it is designated for pension costs. Um, the trust can only be utilized for pension costs in the future. And then the SEP is, of course, as I mentioned, prone to market volatility. What, what city uh, council should consider, um, and just my recommendation is that we open the set and um, do a $1 million uh, one-time contribution to the set program. It is flexible, meaning it, it, we don't require, or CalPERS does not require an annual contribution of any sort. It's just, it's uh, the city is in the driver's seat in regards to this program. And the city council, of course, can consider um, adding additional funds in the future if funds are available. And lastly, SEPT funds can be used in later years to if we were to need these funds uh, for, let's say, a rainy day. 
That concludes the SEC portion. I wanted to open up the council for questions before I move to the last, the SERP. Thank you again for your report. It feels like you've got most of the day today. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, Council Member Huang, any questions? Yes, um, is there any cost for this trust? Yes, it's the 25 basis points or 0.25%. CalPERS <laughs> will take it off of the interest that we earn. All right, thank you. Yeah. Nothing else? Council Member Yudi? No question. Okay, Council Member Shepard Roman? Um, I have a question concerning your this staff report on this. Um, and at, after hearing your presentation, this does sound, if we adopt um, this, like a, uh, a good way to maximize money that we're already going to have to put into this. However, I noticed on um, page 36, uh, the first paragraph of the discussion that uh, you write that 59 participants, there are 59 approximate entities, uh, governmental entities participating in this. And I know, you know, from being a designee to uh, COG and SCAG, and we have over 175 entities just in those bodies for Southern California alone. So I'm trying to get my head around why would the there be so few other participants in this type of trust arrangement? Um, I can initially answer that question. And we also have Matt from CalPERS. He gets this question quite a bit. Um, the finance liaisons have a similar question to him. So why less? It's actually, this program has only been around for two and a half years. It's a new program. So many cities had an opportunity to open this uh, 115 trust, at least the SEP program. That's number one. Number two is um, because the cities have the ability to go directly to CalPERS and start paying the unfunded liability, they can contract with CalPERS. Some many cities actually went directly to CalPERS and have been paying down the unfunded liability directly with them instead of opening up a 115 trust. So that's why another reason why lesser cities have opened up this 115 trust. All right, and my last question is, um, because I do think we heard from CalPERS professional, I don't know if it's the same as, as who was on the line today last year or previously about opening, I'm sorry, I don't have the acronym in my mind, but you said CERT. it at the outset. CERT, yes. CERT. <laughs> um, a CERT uh, trust or yes. fund. And I'm wondering how many other vehicles though are out there that CalPERS is offering because we're kind of being, we as a council are being told about kind of things one at a time. And it's sort of like, if there's a whole buffet of what might be prudent <laughs> investments, what's really the best, but we're getting them kind of piecemeal. And I know even after discussing um, this, you know, we also have the other one added after the fact. I know it was an omission and I'm glad we have these both here before us. But my concern is, are we getting the best use of our money if we're going to commit to putting money in CalPERS trust vehicle for the ultimate payment of our net unfunded pension liability. Um, I would like to see choices as opposed to, or perhaps that's what's being given to a long-term financial committee, I don't know, but I wanted to understand how these are coming to us because we're kind of getting little pieces and I'm sure um, there are many vehicles out there where other cities are both paying down their debt and putting into trust or other vehicles. Um, Matt, are, are you available to potentially add additional um, quite, uh, answers to council member um, Shepard Romney's question? Yeah, I can do that. Can everybody hear me clearly? Yes. yes. So there was a slide that uh, Paul showed that had four columns. And if you don't mind, Paul, if you could go back to that slide, one more to the left, I believe it is. Okay. So our entire menu of options for this trust are the two centered columns. So that is the entire array of options in this 115 trust fund pension space that we offer at CalPERS at this time. The reason why those options are in the middle is because you're already using the tools on the uh, outside two columns. You're using the pension fund for you know, required contributions and debt payments, and you're using LAFE and county treasury for your current year operating budget dollars and reserves and whatnot. So if we had more options to show you, we certainly would, but this is it. On the OPEB side, there are three choices. And 
when you joined, you selected that choice. You're going to talk about the contributions in, in a moment on the next item. The only point I want to make here is that you can actually use both of these simultaneously or pick one. And what Paul has recommended is to pick the more conservative of the two at this time because of it sounds like and what we've discussed concerns about market volatility. So that's my answer. Hopefully that uh, thoroughly answers your question. Did I succeed there? <laughs> yes, that is very helpful and I appreciate it. Um, I'm surprised, but uh, good to know because it is living in a vacuum here um, and not focusing on CalPERS um, on a regular basis. It is, uh, I was interested to know what other strategies um, were available, but since there are the two that does seem to be, our choices are extremely limited. And I appreciate your recommendation, Paul. Um, thank you. Oh, and one other question. Should we decide to do that? And there's nothing similar to um, the last discussion we have. There's nothing in our resolution or motion to direct what strategy we would undertake. Um, so I think that we need to have some language specifying if council decides to do this and wants to follow your recommendation, I would appreciate language at the time to put the appropriate wording in should we decide to go ahead with this. Thank you. I called on you on the hate council member, Yudi. <laughs> Okay, in that case, I will speak. I just want one point of clarification, if I might. Um, if we put this money in um, and we decide we do need it sooner rather than later, how soon could sooner be? Uh, Matt, could you answer that specific question, please? Sure, Paul. I'm, sure, Paul, I'm happy to do that. So if you put the money in today, we would deploy that money um, in the market same day. You could technically reimburse it the next day. So it is up to you. These assets are fully reimbursable back to the city. And all you would have to do to achieve that uh, reimbursability is spend a dollar on pension costs directly to a defined benefit system. So every time you send CalPERS a dollar, whether it be for normal cost contributions when you cut payroll, or debt payments when you cut payroll or in advance in the month of July, or additional discretionary payments as Paul described, you can reimburse dollar for dollar from our trust. We would literally mail a check to you that you would likely deposit back into your general fund, which would now be liquid for whatever purpose you deemed appropriate. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and just to clarify, where it says expected return on strategies one and two, are those rates current? They are current. Um, when I say current, what we do is we review these and update the underlying capital market assumptions on a you know, cycle. And that cycle is once every four years. These capital market assumptions are as of 2019, which means they were pulled on December 31st, 2018. Those are 10-year expected rates of return. And the risk number is a 10-year standard deviation of expected investment returns. We're actually in the process of updating these at this time. And you won't be surprised to learn that capital market assumptions since I've worked at CalPERS in 07 have been declining with respect to the expected return and a identical level of risk. So to achieve the same return, you have to take on more risk. So CalPERS has been declining expected return in the form of discount rate, and our trusts have been reflecting that as well, even though we're not setting a discount rate for you. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, okay, I have uh, no other questions um, at this time. Um, I'd like to open this to the public. I don't see anyone here to comment on this item. Do we have anyone virtually? Let me give folks a moment to raise a hand. No, there are no requests to comment on this item. Okay, thank you. I'd like to bring it back to the group for final discussion. Council Member Udi. Mayor, can I just jump in really quick? Yeah, I still have, need to, I'm not sure regards to sequence, do we finish the SEP first and then should I present the SERP after? I wasn't sure. Uh, you mean um, in succession and then yes. vote? Yes, is, is that the... Yeah. I think procedure. if you want to do one motion, then you yeah. would need to cover both first. So 
Okay, so with... we will then move forward. Correct. My apologies. Yes. May we please have the second presentation? Yeah, my we'll, apologies. Okay. Thank you. For yeah, I just wanted to make sure because it, it is one motion. So yes, thank I you. I need to finish my presentation. Thank you. So just for the city council, the SERP program, which was that special item that was added for consistency purposes, because it's still under the 115 trust. Um, the SERP program is what we opened up for our OPEB, our other post-employment benefits, which is a medical pension cost. We opened that uh, last year, this time last year, basically on February 26, 2021 with half a million dollars. It's performed really well. Um, it has returned 7%. Um, it hit the benchmark that was expected. Um, so now it's sitting at $535,000 in, in less than a year. If it was setting, sitting in LAFE, it would have probably earned about $1,500. So we performed as expected. Um, the unfunded liability on the OPEP side sits at $8 million as we speak. Uh, City Council's consideration is that we contribute $100,000 annually for the next four fiscal years, starting this fiscal year. Um, it's expected to, um, the return that I'm expecting in the next four years, if we, if the council was to approve my recommendation is that it should be close to about 1.3 to $1.5 million. Um, of course, it, it's an approximation that depends on market volatility and the returns, but it's with the compounding effect, I do expect it to be relatively around that um, amount. And lastly, um, the reason for the four years is because the public safety parcel taxes is come to expire in 24-25. And depending upon the outcome of the next public safety parcel tax, um, that's when um, we can I can come back to the city council and reconsider um, doing another annual contribution to the SERP program or SEP, a uh, SERP program, sorry, <laughs> SERP program. <laughs> uh, I'm uh, available for questions. Thank you. Thank you. And again, my apologies for that confusion. Yeah. Uh, okay, so at this point, we'll uh, take questions from council. Council Member Huang. Oh, yes, it's observed. Um, is it run by CalPERS too? Yes. Okay. Um, and do you know what the cost is for us? Yeah, this this one is actually 0.10 or 10 basis points. Okay. So it is cheaper because there's a lot more organizations that has this. How many organize, how many organizations? Uh, Matt, how many SERP do you, uh, accounts do we have or your clients do you have now? Yeah, thank you. Um, at this time, and this goes back to 2007 when we opened and I started this work, we have just over 600 clients, just under 200 cities and towns in California alone, and over 17 billion in assets under management. All right, no more questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilwoman Shepard Romy, any questions? Just so I understand, this money would be um, for the pensions of the PERPA employees? Uh, uh, is that yeah. one's designated to, or health benefits? What is it? It's for it's OPEB. OPEB. It's OPEB, the other post employment benefit for medical pension costs. For all employees. I'm, I keep saying pension, sorry. I'm trying to understand. Medical costs. Retiree health. Retiree health. health. Cost. For all employees, it doesn't matter then classic or purpa. It's not in that same. Correct. That that's not relevant for health insurance. Okay. Thank you. That was I was just unsure as to who all this it's, is for. It's Pepra. Pepra. That's how they refer to Pepra. I'll, I'll get all this someday <laughs> when I'm no longer here. So. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Beauty. About how much money do we have in the bank total? Uh, today, uh, I think last month, Treasurer was $36 million. Yeah, $36 million. Yes. Yeah. And, and these funds, it's either pay me now or pay me later, isn't it? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. So it's either earn 1% or go for 5%. Yes. Thank you. And to clarify on post-employment benefits, that's for both Classic and PEPRA that this covers, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and one more time on the current rate of return. Current rate of return uh, for the SERP program. Mm -hmm. uh, the strategy that we've selected was strategy two and it's close to 5.5% to my understanding. Great. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, at this point, uh, let's take this item to the public. Anybody here? 
Seeing none, do we have anyone online? There are no requests for comments. Thank okay. you. Uh, let's bring it back to council for discussion and uh, decision on the two items. So council member Wong. Well, it just uh, sounds like uh, Calpers. Uh, I mean, uh, to Matt, uh, please don't take this personally. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like um, Calpers is not doing well, and that's why they need more money to make more investments for more return for patient. Thank you. Okay. Councilwoman Shepard Rum. Um, I uh, appreciate the information and um, uh, Director Chung bringing this forward to us. Uh, this is money that we are going to owe and we owe to uh, cover our commitments to our employees long term and it's growing. So I, I think it would be better to put money aside to cover that and hopefully have the benefit because we are limited as a city usually in how aggressive we could be or get a return other than life type. Um, so I appreciate this and, and uh, both of these efforts coming to us as a good prudent investment for our city um, with better returns. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Udy. Uh, it appears to me that the, uh, the 115 trust is a good vehicle, that they're working well and it beats the, uh, the life 1%. So I, I think it's a good idea. Um, I concur. And with that, do we have a motion? Madam Mayor, if I may, uh, Council Member Shepard Rami had asked that if we were going to move forward mm -hmm. with this, that you include something on investment strategies. So our city attorney has uh, quickly drafted some language for you that Thank you would you. include in your motion. Thank you. So um, I will tell you where it goes and then whoever makes the motion, if you want to do it, you just say so yes. moved. I've got it right here. Um, it would essentially be uh, you have the combined motion in front of you, which mm -hmm. we're suggesting is uh, I move to one approve resolution number R2207, approving the SEPT participation agreement with CalPERS for the city to participate in SEPT. Two, approve resolution uh, number R2208, authorizing certain positions in the city to request disbursements. Is that the resolution that it would, that's the resolution it would change, right? And so right there, it would say, uh, you know, comma, to include a provision uh, under section one, subsection D, that says such investments shall be made into the most conservative strategy offered by CalPERS unless otherwise directed by the city council. And then you would go on with number three, four, five, and so forth. Why don't you keep reading three, four, and five? And I'd be so delighted much. to do that, <laughs> council member. <laughs> three, authorize staff to file the necessary forms with CalPERS. Four, make a one-time contribution of $1 million to open the SEPT Section 115 Trust with CalPERS. And five, approve annual contributions of $100,000 to the SERPT Section 115 Trust with CalPERS through fiscal year 24 25 for a total of 400000 Done. So moved. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Roll call, please. Council Member Wong? Uh, no. Council Member Shepard Rami? Yes. Council Member Udy? Yes. Mayor Jacobowski? Yes. Motion passes. Okay. Um, so, where are we now? I will later. return <laughs> uh, to item one Number of our one. regular meeting. Correct? <laughs> Correct. Okay. So, item one is um, the selection of of the priority initiatives going forward. May we please have a presentation from yes, the city manager? Marla? Yes, indeed. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, we will um, we will permit Finance Director Chung to leave the table <laughs> and to move on with his morning, and uh, I will pick it up from here. Thank so you, Director <laughs> Chung. That was a lot of work. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> we come to you as part of your annual budget process. As you know, we had some initial brainstorming about a month ago on potential priority initiatives. We have reached out to the community. We reached inside to our own staff and we heard your brainstorming items as well. And we put together a list of all of the uh, priority initiatives that were selected primarily related to the operating budget. <clears throat> At our last meeting in February, you heard a presentation from Finance Director Chung about our current financial uh, status in this current fiscal year, our mid-year report. You got a, uh, a report on the revenues expected for next year, as well as the long-term uh, long forecast. So you got some, some framework information about where we sit related to our fiscal, uh, our fiscal position. 
Today, we are back to you uh, to come back to the priority initiative process. And just as a reminder, um, we did this for several years, but we did not do this last year. So this is bringing back a process that we have done in previous times. And hopefully it brings back warm memories for you. What has happened so far is given our eight critical success factors, we have a total of 19 items that were brainstormed into those critical success factors. And again, that's combining the brainstorm that we did with you a month ago with staff and with the community <clears throat> to get these items. They have been organized into the critical success factors and those critical success factors plus priority initiatives were included in the budget available to the public uh, in the agenda packet. And in front of you, you have a big version of those, uh, those eight critical success factors and the associated priority initiatives. Community Engagement Manager Quadris is going to be handing those out to you right now, your big pieces of paper. She is also going to be handing out to you what you hopefully have fond memories of, which is your sticker dots, because mm -hmm. today is sticker dot voting day. So um, what we're going to do is give you an opportunity to select five. We made the determination based on the number of 19 potential uh, items to vote on that five sticker dots was the right number. You have three green sticker dots. These are for your very favorite ones. And then you have two yellow sticker dots. These are for the ones that you're also kind of fond of. Of, but don't quite reach the level of green. What we're going to ask you to do, and again, you've seen all of these since the agenda was published, so this is just reframed onto bigger paper, is literally take your sticker dots and vote right on your page and stick it next to the five that you feel strongly about. No double sticker dotting, so one sticker dot per item, even if you feel really, really strongly about it. Um, and just as a reminder for the community, although this was out there, our eight critical success factors are engaged and connected residents, and there were four priority initiatives suggested there. Resident handbook mailers, a civic youth academy, uh, youth civic academy, sorry, wayfinding package for Lacey Park and expanding translation to Spanish. Our next critical success factor is efficient, responsive and effective city services. And there were four there as well to become an accredited public works agency, full service tree consultation services, water conservation plan and citywide strategic plan update. The third critical success factor is safe community. And here we have four, again, we apparently really liked the number four, reduction in speed programs, stormwater pollution prevention ordinance, no smoking ordinance for public parks and purchase emergency preparedness kits. Our next uh, critical success factor is well-maintained infrastructure. And so what we have here is improve the admissions booth at Lacey Park renovate parks and public works facilities at Lacey Park and City Hall, and funding the implementation of the police department utilization study. Um, this is where it gets a little bit confusing. You do still have CIP coming to you in March. So there are still capital related things that will be coming to you at that point, but these fit into this category. So we went ahead and included them. You have attractive complimentary can business. I, can yes. I, because we've read these. I just interrupt here. And I'm happy to not read them. I was just trying to be courteous to the public if they aren't looking at it. I can. Okay, no, 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 I'm not. I don't mean, but because the comment that you just made was exactly what I was thinking because I am in support of improving our admissions booth at Lacey Park, um, as well as um, the parks and works facility, as well as generally the police utilization studies. And to me, these seem like they were capital improvements. So I didn't want to waste of stickers, <laughs> <laughs> which are limited if these come back under a different guise and are they expected to do that? Because these are very important and I don't All want right. to short circuit that, but I also, there are many other things here that are very worthy. And so All right. that is I want to understand what I can do about this. A point well taken. I will make an on the fly correction and say, if you would take, I'm sure you have a writing utensil with you, if you would just put your initial next to things that you'd like to see come forward in the CIP, then we'll include them and you'll have another stab at this next month when we come forward with CIP. You don't need to spend a sticker dot on them um, and then we'll, we'll address it that way. Okay, thank you. I because appreciate that. I do okay. think- because yes. those are All more specific. Yep, absolutely. Point well taken. Thank okay. you very much. Okay. All right. Your next critical success factor is attractive complementary business district. There was only one proposal uh, from the council. This was uh, on the economic development program. Uh, our next one is inviting and relevant city facilities. Now, to my earlier comment, the conversation that Council Member Shepard Rami and I had, these 
are not capital items. So you would, if you want these, you would, you need to sticker dot them. So there are two under here, green action plan and community garden. And then last but not least, uh, beautiful preserved single family residential neighborhoods. And the one item under here that was proposed was a vacancy tax. So that is what you have in front of you are those 19. We appreciate you uh, taking a stab at sticker dotting these. What we are going to do after you have a chance to ask any questions that you might have uh, is ask you to vote. And then I'm going to beg the mayor to call a recess so that we can collect your forms, count them and see where we are. If there are too many for us to be able to handle in next year's budget, then after your recess, we may come back and ask you to vote again. Now on the combined number and do a second round. If we think we can bite them all off, then I will come back and say, we're good. And we can move on to the next item. So green was green is I really want this. Okay. Yellow, is yellow is want it. I want it. Right. All right. So, okay. uh, Madam Mayor, make sure I had my color categories. <laughs> okay. I'd like to open this up for questions. Uh, Council Member Huang. Uh, no, I don't have any questions right now. Thank you. Okay. Council Member Yudi. No questions. Okay. Council Member Shepard Romy. I do have a question regarding Green Action Plan because this goes in part to what would be encompassed by our general plan update, I thought. It's one of the items here as priorities. And I know because community members probably, and we've mentioned, I've mentioned this, but wouldn't that be something that would be part of our general plan update? Because I, I believe we're required to at least do some sort of environmental review and by the state. I mean, there are certain categories here. We discussed this with our city attorney a couple meetings ago. Yes, it's my understanding that there's some pieces that will be addressed in the general plan update, but if you really wanted a focused and comprehensive green action plan, that would be a separate item and we would be we would be addressing it separately. Okay. Thank you. Sure. And you had no questions, correct? Um, am I allowed to share what was given to me by the public about a combination of two or would this not be the appropriate time? It's an interesting concept. Uh, Let me go for it. Well, you could say, question on the fly was much easier. Um, <laughs> okay, um, so basically uh, one of the items was um, renovate the admissions booth at Lacey Park. And it was recommended from the public that we include the wayfinding signs on that booth so not have clutter in the park, but as you often see when you enter different facilities, it could be a two for one, if you will. So, okay, then I would suggest that um, we don't need to address that just now. If it turns out that both of those programs are moving forward, then we would consider that Got as it. we constructed the program. Thank you very much. Okay. Mayor, can I add a comment to that? You bet. Maybe we can put it on the internet. They can use their phone to find the directions around. Oh, awesome. Then we don't even need to add a any QR code. Wow. You better, well, somebody <laughs> better be sticker dotting that idea then because. Oh, well, that's not here, so I can't stick it. We may have a full, a full new item with these different combinations. All right, then if there are no further questions, I would request that you commence sticker dotting. Uh, let me ask if the oh. public has anything first, and of then course. we will go back to our dots. Um, I see nobody here. Is there anybody online who'd Mr. like- Mr. Neer, did you wanna- Oh, yeah. please, I'm so uh, sorry. I was excited too, Mayor. <laughs> Easy to overlook. <laughs> well, well on, the, on this issue, and I don't have all the green dots and all these, these, uh, these lists- But you've but got I, verbal dots, so please go for it. Okay, so what I would suggest uh, uh, priority things is one, you continue what you're doing on uh, your roads and sidewalks, that's number one. Some new things that I would suggest that you consider as priority things, two of them are quite expensive and two are not so expensive. One is I think you need to address st the Stoneman uh, situation, the Stoneman uh, buildings there and what you're gonna do with them and make them uh, more usable to the community. Uh, the second thing is I think that you ought to address uh, expanded parking within Lacey Park. and. I had a, a plan, I hired an architect some four, six, eight years ago, came up with an, what I thought was a very good plan. I gave it to the city. I don't know where those uh, plans are now. I tried to find them in my computer, but right now I can't find them at all. I can always get them somehow. So uh, Stoneman and uh, parking at Lacey Park are two things that I think you ought to address. Two other things that I think you ought to address, which are less relative 
would be less expensive. And one would be to uh, develop a dog park within Lacey Park. And it's in that area that's on the west side that's already fenced in and bushed and people wouldn't see it at all. I think that could be done relatively inexpensively. Secondly, uh, on this side of it, I think that you ought to consider a, a more bicycle lanes. You only have one up down, up in north and south on uh, Del Mar. But I think for public transportation, for safety of young people, for encouraging alternative means of transportation and doing what every other city is, is doing, I think you ought to install bicycle lanes within the city. And by the way, we have plans at the city for that. There was a consultant hired. I think you ought to take a look at that and select some of those things that are, have already been suggested. Thank you. Thank you very much. M Madam Mayor, we don't, I know we don't normally comment on public comment, but just so that you know, we did get those comments from Mr. Neer previously. Those are all capital related and Parks and Public Works Director Throne does have all of those. They mm -hmm. won't be on today's sticker. Wonderful. Today. And thank you for caring. Anyone um, online who'd like to comment? I'm not seeing any raised hands. No request for comment. Thank, thank you very much. Okay, so now I believe we're at the point to take out our dots. You get excited, don't you? I know, I get excited when I see those dots. Um, uh, if you would, I don't know if this is legally acceptable, but perhaps if you call a recess for about 15 minutes and then just stick your dot and as you go off to wherever you go during recess, you can drop your, your form off. Okay, so in that case, I've got 10.01. We will reconvene at 10.15. How's that? Excellent. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you, Council.
Probably needed. Um, you're missing. No, you're at your hearing. Um, three years to life. Um, <laughs> before we move forward, I understand, Dr. Marlowe, you have an announcement about our dot exercise. Yes, thank you for sticker dotting. And um, Vice Mayor Talt has returned. I will capture his sticker dots as well. Uh, we will not need a second round of voting. So thank you very much. In a future staff report, we'll um, identify for the public what the sticker dot results results were, but we think that we're good to go for the budget. So this item is concluded. Thank you all so much. We're ready to move on. Back to your regular agenda, item number four. Thank you very much. Okay, so for item number four, award of the multi-year tree maintenance and planting program agreement. Uh, may we please have a report from Director Throne. Thank you, Mayor. Um, given the hour, I think I will be very concise. With the expiration of the last multi-year tree maintenance agreement, the department took the opportunity to update the agreement terms and conditions and enhance the services necessary to meet community expectations by incorporating tree care best management practices. Bids were solicited and the department recommends the council award a five-year agreement to Mariposa Tree Management. As there are still several months left to the fiscal year, we are recommending they commence, more, commence work right away, pending your approval of year one of the agreement. Year two of the agreement that would begin July 1st is contingent on an appropriation by the city council, which the department will be proposing as part of its fiscal year 2022-23 operating budget. This concludes the staff presentation. Thank you. Uh, we will move on to questions from council. Council Member Huang, any questions? Uh, yeah, um, I'm looking at a 2018, uh, our agreement with uh, Mariposa. So it was 264,000. Um, would you say the amount of work is about the same for this new contract or it's more or less? You, um, it is more. Uh, we have added a significant number of uh, trees to be planted uh -huh. and a portion of those funds are actually identified in your capital improvement program. So that added about um, added 120 trees at uh, I think several hundred dollars per tree. One moment, please. I think it's 24 it's, spots. It's uh, six, that added $63,000 to uh, the work that we have been doing. Um, we also really increased our specifications. Uh, we, we made it more rigorous. We are now really employing best management practices. Uh, we've articulated those very, uh, very precisely in the agreement. And there's also just been basically since 2018, some inflationary actions, uh, basically uh, as it relates to labor, this is very labor intensive work. Okay. And um, I'm sorry, because you just mentioned 120 trees that we plant every year. So how many do we remove again? Sorry, I forget. Uh, typically, uh, we come to you with about um, 60 to 80 tree removals a year. And so we are like, we're looking to plant 120 trees a year. And how many of those 120 trees usually survive in uh, like five to 10 year long run? Well, with this agreement, we hope that all of them will, because we are putting the <laughs> onus on their uh, first year management on Mariposa to maintain. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, if the tree dies during the one year period, then they would be obligated to replace the tree with a new one. Uh, these won't be 15 gallon trees. These will be the larger 24 to 36 inch trees, because that is the community standard now. Great. Thank you. No more questions. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Udy? No questions. Councilwoman Shepard Romy? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I wanted to thank you, and I know it's the comments, uh, and also I, Mr. Estrada is not here, but please give him mm -hmm. my deepest thanks. I had a couple questions, some of which I communicated to you, and thank you for getting back with the uh, written so promptly. Um, my concerns have to do with notice and it still remains because in this new contract, we have, and I'm looking on page 253, I think, um, or maybe it's a different page. Hold on for just a second, if you will. I'm trying to get to the one where it talks about, my, my point is just in here, oh, here, uh, page 261 is the scheduling, service scheduling and parking notification. 
that's the only discussion about parking. Um, and if you look at 10.2, for those following on their uh, iPads or what have you at home, um, 10.2 actually is the only discussion and the 10.3 about mm -hmm. notification of work, tree work done. It's in the context of parking initially. And I am very, very concerned. I appreciate that notices will be in English and Chinese now, um, and they'll be affixed with twine to the tree, I assume that means, uh, for removals. And then there's no parking. But what concerns me here is the departure from what we currently have in our policies and procedures, which you've attached, and I understand is incorporated mm -hmm. or into this. Um, but it's gone to 36 hours for no parking, which is fine, but 72 hours in advance for the work. That's So that's essentially three days. And right now we have two, 10 business days or two weeks, 14 days. And if you recall, just let me finish mm -hmm. the thought. We were, the um, community was concerned about that because of the area of Brentwood and Brentford mm -hmm. and San Marino Avenue. And there was, uh, the removal of multiple large oak trees incorrectly on Brentford when the dead ones were on San Marino. And so that whole area is still not recovered um, because of that. So I want to know, my question is whether we can change this and get back to our correct notification period um, in here, because I don't want to have something um, for 72 hours when the community has already spoken and we adopted a policy of quite a lo much longer to avoid such problems in the future. Uh, Council member, there's actually two parallel components to that. One is the public noticing, which will remain the 10 business days uh, to a property owner that um, a tree is going to be removed or planted in front of their house. The other one refers to the requirements <laughs> of the vehicle code that you post no parking within a certain amount of time of when that occurs. Right, I'm putting aside the parking. I'm not- So the we, we will be maintaining the, the 10 business days. Uh, that's that's our standard and that's, that's council policy. So that would uh, in many cases override what's going on here. There are some locations where if we're inside Lacey Park, um, you know, there's really no residents around that we would put noticing to, but I will make sure that we correct that, that it's, uh, it's consistent, the uniformity of the public noticing. Okay, so I'm still trying to figure out, the sentence says, and distribute written notice door hangers to affected residents of pending work 72 hours in advance of work. So, so to me, that does not say mm -hmm. two weeks or 10 business days that we have in our policies. So our policy is 10 days that we, we send notice to the property owner. Then following up on that three days before, we also will notice them once again. Um, a lot of folks get material from the city and it appears to be junk mail and it disappears. So we really have a, a belt and suspenders uh, approach to noticing the public in addition to the no parking signs that would go up also. 72 hours before the work. So we are keeping the 10 days that's written notice to the property owners. And then a certain number of days beforehand, then those property owners are directly notified uh, on site that there's work going to be done. So if they, have, if they hadn't realized they had received a written notice, they would then get uh, a physical notice at their property and they would still have enough time to contact us in case they uh, had any uh, questions or concerns. There is no discussion of that written notice being mailed 10 days in this document. And that's what's concerning me. I'm, I hear you about the 72 hours mm -hmm. and that your intention is that that's a secondary line of notice. But if it's the only notice discussed in this and Mariposa is doing all this work, presumably planting and removing trees now, it's not mm -hmm. the city. We will not have a hand in there or it would be a waste of staff's time to be then sending out written notices in addition to what's done here. So that's, I we, don't understand we can, why we, we can't can make amend this, it. Uh, um, Council Member, we can uh, clarify this through uh, a written change order with Mariposa so that it's very clear as to what the order of notifications are so that we maintain that Council policy of 10 working days. 
Okay, as well as the posting of the signs on the trees. Yes. All together, mm -hmm. thank you. And my other question um, had to do with what uh, Council Member Wong taught, talk, touched on, sorry, that right now we're removing approximately, I get 78 looking at the last two years and 80 or so trees every year. And I think um, after discussion as well with the um, fire chief and our new director of planning and building, um, or I'm sorry, community development is the term, right? Um, that we are losing a lot of trees during storms that your crews clean up and that type of thing. So we're easily losing a hundred trees a year um, just by nature and by city removals. And so um, I appreciate that we're gonna have 120, but I'm um, hoping at some point, if we're not able to keep up, that we'll be able to add to that. But thank you mm -hmm. for coming forward with that. And is there a price point in here? Should we need to replace more trees? Um, as this is uh, an operating expense, okay. uh, this would be part of your regular budget. So when we bring our uh, budget request to pay for year two, uh, if the county Councils entertains um, a, a request to increase that, then we would certainly line item that and, and add that to the contract. Or, or if there was significant loss mm -hmm. in our community yes. because of drought conditions and failure due to pests or whatever. Thank exactly. you. All right. Um, then those are, um, I believe, my questions. I may have to come back. Okay. Vice Mayor Tom. Question? I, I'm sorry. Did you you've been so used to skipping did i skip again. you <laughs> no i have no question oh okay just checking oh. <laughs> <laughs> um how many of our city trees are uh hacked apart by the utility uh action i know, I know for example on mission <laughs> there is sc or one of the utilities come in and hack those trees but are there other city trees that, that would normally fall under this that that, that happens to? Uh, from my experience, uh, there isn't a substantial amount of city trees that are um, pruned with impunity by the electric company. Uh, the vast majority of trees um, are private trees because the utility lines run behind the houses yes. and really not in the public right of way. Well, except for up and down, uh, I believe up and down Del Mar. Del Mar, uh, and, and that's a very tall, that's a very high line. And uh, our trees generally, when we plant underneath utility lines, we plant trees that won't encroach into that. Um, Oak Knoll, definitely has some very substantial trees there, but as a percentage of the 11,000 plus or minus trees we own, uh, it's probably half a percent, it, uh, 500 trees. When they uh, prune with impunity, um, we don't pay for that. That's something that they- We do not. We make it painful for them to do it, but okay. we don't pay for it. Okay, no further questions. Thank you. Um, okay, I have a few. So in moving the young trees over to Mariposa, and again, I'm, I'm not feeling as confident of my reading of this, so it may have very well have been in here. Um, is there now going to be a guarantee on their ability to exist for X amount of time? Yes, they have a one-year uh, warranty on each tree. Um, they are to... Um, maintain them, they are to water them on schedule, and then uh, the tree survives after the year, it's been uh, by definition established. Thank you. Um, about the stump grinding, we, we all know, who, those of us who've done it, it's pricey. So these hundred trees, are they existing stumps that need to be taken out? Or is that part of what we plan on for the removal of the tree and then the stump being the additional cost? Uh, it's a little bit of both. Uh, many times uh, a tree will be removed and it'll just pop out of the ground and you really won't mm -hmm. have much of a stump. Uh, the smaller diameter trees, we can locate a new tree next to it without really needing to grind the stump. Uh, once you get over uh, probably about a 12 inch diameter, it becomes more difficult to plant a tree 
with good proximity because of the stump that's there. Uh, we have locations where we've got vacancies, but the vacancies are filled with stumps and we would like to grind those out in order to plant trees there. So it's, um, it's, an, it's an added service that we, we find that we do need during the year. So you're finding the stump removal to be more um, purposeful as opposed to aesthetically pleasing because it's getting ready for something to follow. Yes. Great. Um, how did you determine on the mulch? Is that sort of an average of what we've been using over the years? Um, I asked uh, my guys how much mulch do they need? And they gave me a really nice number and said, we also want it to be broadcast. We just don't want a giant pile of mulch. Right. So uh, they, they came up with that number that to them seemed to be a, a reasonable amount to apply in the medians. Uh, we will also be getting mulch and compost uh, from Athens ultimately as part of SB 1385 work. So we will have plenty of, of, of that. It's very effective ground cover. We place it around, underneath the trees. It keeps the weeds down. It also um, helps with um, base, the, the basic um, health of the root structure because it does allow um, water to permeate through it. And the broadcasting is a nice addition. So mm -hmm. thank you for including that. And my final question, when you said you expect 60 to 80 removals each year, um, thank you for often forwarding the, the heartbreaking pictures of those. Um, so that would be an added cost to this um, amount of um, 414, correct? No, it would be included. We, we plan to do 120 replacements of which about half of those or maybe uh, half 60, 65% are those that we bring to you for approval. Then there's these other trees that uh, don't meet the council threshold, the four inch trees or the six inch trees or trees that fall over or trees that blow down, uh, those are all considered removals. So I'm so sorry to do this. Would you mind um, going to um, BP2 or 68 of 348 and just sort of help me to understand where those removals are addressed on that line item? I see planting trees, but um, I might just be missing it. Uh, that would be item 11. Ah, so this includes Includes trees stump and stump grinding, but then we don't have stump grinding as its own item for trees that have already been felled. In, in those particular cases, uh, if we would not do it ourselves, because we do have a nice stump grinder. Oh, we do. Mm -hmm. uh, which we don't dispatch because it's, uh, it's a big process to dispatch. It is a very large stump grinder for very large trees. And most of the time it's really more effective for us to just hire that out. Uh, we also have a crew rental um, uh, line item that if we need that, that stump grinding, we can always ask um, Mariposa as, hey, we need to add this extra stump crown, it's nearby. And uh, if, we, if it's within the budget, then we will be able to do it. So I'm fine going forward, but I'm just taking that 414 that 414,000, 15,000 that we have right now. With the additional costs, what is the real number in your mind's eye that this will cost us when we have, um, since we've combined tree removal and stump grinding, knowing we've got maybe others of each um, or some additional work, about how much more do you think we should add on? I, I think this is the, this is the plan that we came up with. These items per year is what we have seen in the last four or five years, which can be reasonably accomplished in a calendar year. Uh, we have our, our grid pruning cycle, which is a, about a five-year cycle, rotates through, through town. Uh, that's worked very good for us. Um, at this point, we don't. We, we've added a little bit more in each of some of these line items because we're anticipating a little bit of growth. Um, and this is really, um, from our perspective and our judgment, this, this is the contract that we'll be able to satisfactorily uh, manage and we'll get moving forward our, our tree program and keeping everything up to date. And uh, if anything, in future years, we may want to become more aggressive on tree planting 
And that's something that the council would be able to consider as part of your regular municipal operating budget approval. Thank you. So those emergency tree removals would still be under this. Yes. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And um, I appreciate the detailed report. Um, do Mayor, we... can I ask a question before we move to the Absolutely. public? Absolutely. Um, this reminded me um, about the watering what your discussion and the maintenance of those first year trees. And in, I believe one, um, okay, page 257, which is 121.26.5, it talks about um, a daily log of trees being watered and then um, maintained in digital and that there'll be invoicing for tree watering services. So just to get to the mayor's point, is that an additional cost? Like, are we paying for the water? Will, will we be billed beyond this contract for the water used for that first year of watering and maintenance or elsewhere? I don't know if you, you know, just put trees that seem to be doing poorly because of the water drought conditions. Um, is that going to be an ongoing program and is the water costs and doing that additional? Is that no, what invoicing it, here is talking about or what, what is this for? Uh, invoicing in, in this uh, context is letting us know that they watered the tree. So it would be part of their, oh. of their reporting. Uh, the planting of the tree and establishing of it includes the watering as part of that year long cost of, of having the tree there. All right, so it won't. And the use of reclaimed water as well. I thought that was um, very progressive, but so they are committing to use reclaimed non-potable well, we put it in the specifications for them to go and get it. So they'll have to bring a truck full of re reclaimed water. And again, not an additional cost to us that's built into this contract. Amount. Correct. And my final question is, I know that you've included crew services, whether the city needs them or, or whatever, rental, essentially mm -hmm. a homeowner, but things like pruning, or we had a discussion in the back when a tree is um, damaged and falls because of weather or something, uh, and has to be removed or is fallen over. Are they able to access the this contract? Are residents able to access this to get an arborist to come out and consult on replacing or the damage? What can be done? Is that something that would include residents' ability under this contract to work with Mariposa and have certified arborist services? I know it was part of our priority initiatives, this full tree consultation services, but because Mr. Estrada's time is is Mm -hmm. so stretched so thin um so i'm wondering what's included when you have crew rental is it also an arborist rental possibility that would only be for public trees either okay. on pub public property or in the right of way the priority initiative was intended to address the the private trees and private services that would need be needed for those trees okay thank you oh and one other question uh about we have residents who also trim the trees outside their home. Is that also something Now they're public trees, but in, because they're in the public right of way, but they include that or in the past, they've been able to pay to have it done more frequently than the four or five year cycle. Is that going to be possible for residents to do that? Because I know I'll get questions. It's <laughs> under 5.4. It is covered. Yeah. Thank you. Pruning by private property. Owners. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, my question has been answered. Uh, second round for questions only. Are there any other questions from council members? If not, I'll open it up to public comment. Anyone here? I see no one. Um, anyone online? There are no requests for comment on this item. Okay, in that case, um, I'll bring it back for discussion and um, Thoughts? Uh, shall we start with Council Member Kwong? Um, yes, I can support this. Thank you. Okay. Council Member Yudi? I think Mariposa does a good job. Okay. Council Member Shepard Rami? Um, thank you. I can support this with the addition of some notification requirements um, to make sure that Mariposa is aware, aware uh, um, specifically because that's the only item that worries me in this regard. But other than that, I'm um, very thankful to the director and Mr. Estrada for bringing this forward. And I hope that we will be happy with uh, Mariposa um, and their tree management plan. Thank you. Vice Mayor Tom? I can support it. Uh, I support also. Um, do I have a motion? 
I move to award the multi-year tree maintenance and planting program agreement to Mariposa Tree Management Inc. with the fiscal year 2021-2022 year one contract amount of $229,195 with subsequent contract fiscal years contingent upon a appropriation by city council with the city manager being authorized to execute the agreement on behalf of the city as well as it two one-year contract extensions subject to city council appropriation and satisfactory performance. Do Second. I have okay. roll call please? Council member Wong? Yes. Council member Shepard Rami? Yes. Council member Yudi? Yes. Vice Mayor Talt? Yes. Mayor Jacobowski? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. And I swear you said pity manager, but that <laughs> Um, approval of a temporary contract hiring program. Uh, we, we please have a presentation from Chief Contra. Good morning, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council. The possibility exists that the department will lose a number of people, could lose a number of people in the coming months. With that in mind, it's my responsibility as the Chief of Police. Uh, it's important to maintain the ability to uh, safely police this uh, department, this city. We um, undertook a research and discussions of different methods and different uh, ways of uh, filling the void and also uh, what could be fiscally sound to the, to, uh, the city. As you're all aware, hiring a police officer is a labor intensive and time consuming process. We recruit lateral personnel, which are those that are from existing police departments, academy graduates who have not um, been hired by any other agency, but have completed their basic academy. And then individuals who have no law enforcement experience, but express a desire to uh, become police officers. The process involving lateral officers is the shortest. It could be uh, six months to eight months. The uh, process for an academy grad is six months less than uh, uh, that of a police officer who'd had, or a person who has no law enforcement experience, which could be up to 30 months. We looked at uh, approximately four options. One is to do uh, nothing and uh, just have our officers work overtime. However, having officers work continual overtime uh, can create significant problems for their health, morale, and safety. Two other options we looked at was entering into a contract with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. Um, that, that's not an option that uh, I believe is acceptable for the community of San Marino. And the other was to look at contracting with or hiring individual officers from one of the other 44 agencies within Los Angeles County. After discussions with uh, city's attorneys and others and amongst ourselves, um, that was problematic because of potential liability issues that include the city's responsibility for injuries to those individuals. What if they become in a, uh, involved in a use of force, both non-lethal and lethal? if they're involved in misconduct uh, and other risk management issues. The final um, choice was uh, developing and creating a contract hiring program with those other 44 agencies. Uh, each one of those agencies, their officers are, their employees are sworn officers based upon 830.1 of the penal code, which specifically cites their um, law enforcement status. They've all completed the basic police academy and completed the basic uh, time period for uh, new officers, which is approximately one year. We believe that uh, moving our officers to uh, work daytime, 6 a.m., 6 p.m., is the best. That way we would have officers for patrol, working with the schools, the communities, and also um, having enough people to be uh, detectives and investigate crimes that are occurring. We would uh, maintain a sergeant on two of the nighttime shifts. That person would provide uh, leadership, uh, be able to uh, answer questions, be kind of a guide to the other officers. 
and also ensure that proper notifications and uh, accounting of any crime that may have occurred during that time period was, uh, was taken care of. We would have a sergeant, a corporal, or even an officer and then two other officers for a total of four personnel from these agencies. They would be um, working 12 hours and 33 minutes per shift, which is the same as our shifts, plus an hour would be provided to them for travel time. As we hire, we will continue to hire new employees during this time period. As we hire more officers, we will use less contract employees. To ensure adequate staffing from the outside, uh, excuse me, please, uh, table one indicates the uh, approximate cost or total cost of $1,478,726 per year. And uh, the table two is what the current cost with full benefits for our current staff. And they have uh, $1,298,345.36. The anticipated increased cost of the general fund, if the council approves this, could be $180,381. There will be additional costs or could be additional costs if um, there is any uh, potential overtime based upon arrests, um, <coughs> other investigations during their work time. There could be uh, also requirement of appearing in court or at other administrative hearings. This program, if approved by uh, city council, city manager will have the authority to enter into the contracts, each not to exceed 130,000 monthly and substantially the form attached subject to the city attorney review. Staff recommends the council approve the temporary contract police hiring program as a method to continue policing services if the council concurs, the staff recommends an appropriate staff recommends this appropriate motion to be moved to approve the temporary contract police hiring program for up to the next three years and allocate funding from general fund reserves each month as needed, not to exceed $130,000 with the approval of the city manager follow, following review by the city attorney. I'm available for any questions. Thank you for your report. Uh, let's start with council. Councilwoman Shepard Romy. Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, Chief, I had a couple questions regarding the sourcing. I think it's one of the, uh, you briefly discussed it, and it's discussed in here the decision making as to where additional officers would be hired from, but it's not specific. So I understand you looked at, or, or your staff, you and staff and uh, manage city management um, considered the sheriff's department or other sworn agencies, but that was not acceptable. But then you are talking about hiring from other Los Angeles County police agencies. So I, I don't understand what that means, I guess. <laughs> what, to a non-expert um, in the field, those seem the same to me. So I'm trying to figure out what other agencies would be subject to this. My apologies, uh, council member. Uh, we considered exclusively contracting with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. They um, do provide the services. Right. Other uh, cities like La Cunada, perhaps, right? Uh, well, whatever. La Cunada is a contract city, but more recently within the past, I believe, three years or four years, uh, the city of Sierra Madre was oh. unable to fill their vacancies. And for a similar uh, work period, they uh, they contracted with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. Thank you. Okay. And but we are not doing that. So no. because you don't you're putting it. Okay, go ahead. Explain. The, there's um, issues surrounding um, decisions by the sheriff and the board of supervisors that makes sure. it much more complex uh, for us to become involved with the sheriff's department. Okay, but I'm, I understand that. So I'm not questioning the decision, but I'm just trying to figure out, so who is left, if you will, uh, in layman's term, what other agencies of the county might be um, uh, our officers in uh, this contractual arrangement? As I said, I do apologize for my uh, answer <laughs> earlier. It would be the other 43 law, municipal law enforcement agencies within Los Angeles County. 
Those so, are all member agencies of the Los Angeles County Police Chiefs Association. So other cities? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Primarily? Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. And then the other question I had, sorry, um, had to do with if, depending on separation from a number of officers, if that happens, unfortunately, um, it, are there budgetary cost savings that we are anticipating as well once separation occurs? There will be salary savings that could be used. Um, those were issues that were discussed with the finance director. He may have a more specific answer, but uh, there will be because we won't have the uh, personnel in those positions. Right. So would so the 130, I think it was approximately monthly additional, does or does not take, do these figures here take into account a certain percentage of cost savings from reduced salary um, expenses? Or I, don't, I just am trying to figure out how it all goes together with our existing budget for the police department. Initially, yes. However, we will continue to hire police officers to fill the vacant positions. And as we hire the additional police officers filling those vac vacancies, the any salary savings will be de decreased by okay. each hire. And will it come before council or is this a budget matter that is annually renewed or will there be um, certain points when you've reached, hopefully, um, before three years or is this a three year process that you're asking us to approve in full today? It is estimated to be three years. As I've indicated in the report that it could take up to 30 months to hire. It takes approximately 30 months to hire an individual who has no law enforcement experience. Mm -hmm. uh, the three primary parts of hiring are the search for an employee. The second one is the uh, recruitment and recruitment process, which is the initial, well, the initial uh, written test through the interview, the background, other testing until we provide a, a, a higher date and they start. Then we have the training at a police academy and then we have, a, have training in the field. So those are the three major components of this time period. All right, thank you very much, I appreciate it. Thank you. Council Member Udy? The $130,000, that's an annual amount, isn't it? No, sir, 130,000 is a monthly amount. Then help me understand how no, that no. million five is more than table one. I'm sorry. I think I think the staff the staff report does say it's an annual amount. Yeah, that's that's 180 thousand annual amount. Annual. Yeah. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, because it just in the motion it wasn't clear that that 130 was annual. But thank you for clarifying. And if I may also, Council no. Member. What we're proposing to you is kind of a worst case scenario. If we do lose 11 and it does take the full three years to fill, this is what we would be looking at. In a better case scenario, it wouldn't go this long and or wouldn't require as many officers. But this is the, this is the extent of what we think we might be looking at in a worst case scenario. Understand, thank you. Doesn't it say here in the well, hi highlighted box, it's 130? Um, I would, Council okay. Member Udy, are you done? I am. Okay, we'll come back around again, okay? Um, Council Member Hong. Um, yes, I'm Chief. How many um, police officers do we have in the department? Our current uh, status is 26. So 11 out of 26. And do you have um, any idea like how, what the percentage of vaccinated police officers is in these 43 or 44 cities? Uh, the only official information we have is the public announcement by the POA that there are 11 unvaccinated officers. No, no, I'm talking about in the 44 cities. Oh, in percentage. The I apologize. Percentage of, I'm not talking about department. I mean, do you I can't tell you specific percentages with every department. However, some, I one, I was told it's 100. Uh, other agencies are significantly less. So there is a broad range of uh, numbers of officers that are vaccinated. And um, did you say um, earlier that uh, Sierra Madre is having problem filling its office? That was in regards to a specific problem three to four years ago. However, every department 
across the country in Los Angeles County here in San Marino are all having a difficult time filling police officer positions. I mean, so even if we pass this today, we might, we'll, we'll still have problem looking, you know, filling in our department, right? It's possible. We, um, yeah, I mean, we were part, of, part of my research, I looked at uh, our past hiring numbers, our patterns, uh, how many officers we've lost, how many officers we've been able to retain. And on a average, we believe it will take up to three years. Uh, we have two people currently in the process. No one has been given a, a job offer at this point, but we have two uh, individuals in the hiring process to become a police officer, right? Okay, thank you, Chief. Uh, man, I know you have a tough job. I wouldn't want that, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your editorial call. <laughs> Um, Council member, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor Tom. Uh, yes, I, I'm going to see through questions whether we can clear up this the issue. First of all, are you uh, under this agreement, which it, it, it's not necessarily going to end when COVID ends. I mean, we could always use this agreement in case there's an emergency situation so like Sierra Madre. Dad, yes, sir. Okay. Um, so this is kind of a putting in a safety net. Once more, I'm sorry. It, this is kind of like putting in a safety net, and, and it's it's not necessarily limited to the COVID issue, but the COVID issue certainly highlights it. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, if I take a look at the proposed agreement costs on table one and table two, Presently, for two police officers, one uh, corporal and one sergeant, we pay one hundred eight thousand a month. Correct. Yes. Okay. Full benefits. Yes. The full benefits, and under the the proposed agreement costs that you're looking at, is as opposed to the hundred eight, we would spend one hundred twenty three thousand. Yes, sir. So the the actual cost difference is it will be an additional what is that 14,000 a month yes sir okay thank you I have no further questions okay thank you uh I'm so sorry that we have this agenda item and thank you for the work that you have put into it um I just have a few questions um one of the first options you listed was OT um, did you explore using that option for the first 30, 60, 90 days to see how um, things sort of shake out and how it will sort of change within the community? And part of the reason I'm asking that is, of course, bringing outside officers in, they would not have um, a deep knowledge of our community. Is that something that was explored? Yes, ma'am. And the, you're feeling that that just wouldn't work for a short term? We currently are using overtime to staff our positions daily. When we have officers that attend training, the fact that we have two officers uh, less than what our authorized strength is to um, handle football games, to handle parades, to... Uh, handle any other special detail, our officers are working overtime every single day, 24 hours a day. When someone is sick and we need uh, someone to work, it is not the same as the fire department where they have a mandated staffing, but we want to have a safe staffing load. And if, my, I'm so sorry. And I mean specifically as a transitional role um, for the community. I, I apologize for not being clear. In my professional opinion, for me to ask my officers to work beyond 30 days to staff these positions, if it is 11, we will not, we will have six officers, police officers, to work four shifts, to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. To ask those officers to do that for any extended period of time will compromise their health, 
the safety of themselves, the safety of the, the community. And I'm not willing to do that. That's a good answer. Thank you. Um, moving over to um, your proposed letter, um, where it says that we will begin about April 1 and anticipate deployment of agencies on about March 25th. Um, would I presume that would be an orientation period? This, this letter has gone out under my signature with the understanding by the city manager to make other agencies aware and to determine if this is an acceptable proposition. At this time, I can't tell you how many agencies have either offered or not offered to do this, but I need, because of the time for an orientation, for specific training in our systems, our process, uh, I wanted to have this out so I could start moving forward out of concern for our community. Okay, so to say my, my apologies, I know that I'm not saying this correctly. So um, I'm concerned about the residents. Um, this is going to be a twofold hit. People who they know are now gone and there will be people who they have never seen before who will be from other departments. Um, they will be driving our vehicles. No, ma'am. Okay, so that's going to add a little bit more confusion for the residents. So I think maybe where I want to go on this is I understand you need to do what you need to do. I'm looking from the resident's viewpoint to make sure um, that it's easy enough to, to blast in the community what the game plan is, but I'm concerned about um, the plan um, for those officers coming in. So that was why I was bringing up the two different dates. Um, how, how much time would you imagine or hours or whatever would be needed to help orient those officers to our community? I would probably have between four to eight hours for each agency. Um, best scenario. I will know what agencies are willing to do this. We will meet with them from 48 hours, four to eight hours. We will orient them to our processes, our systems. And I would like to involve community members uh, so they understand who they are. We will put out information. We will have pictures available. We can even on social media post what agency is working that day. The reason I have one of our sergeants working the same shift is that's the person who's going to be the liaison, who's going to be able sure. to talk to the community. It's going to be a face. It's going to be a name that they know. Uh, I'll be working a lot of long hours and I will be out and about and I'll be talking to anybody and everybody. And I'll be working along with my commanders to make sure the community has a um, complete understanding or as best as I can an understanding of uh, what is going on. Also that um, we will work on making sure they feel safe, which is the most important and they have a name. And since almost everybody in the community has my cell phone, I'm sure I'll be getting a few more calls. <laughs> Um, since this letter doesn't have a deadline or date by which we want to hear from you and it has gone out, um, when do you think you might be able to have um, a picture of what the response is or isn't? I plan on doing a follow-up to all the agencies to, to definitely get an answer. Also, when um, the process, personnel process is complete, uh, that will also give me a better understanding of when the start date will, and I will be communicating with uh, those other agencies. Uh, the Los Angeles County Police Chiefs Association meets uh, monthly. However, we do have an occasional weekly meeting. And as being the past president, I'm able to ask the president to 
call a meeting. And we usually have those on Monday afternoons. I appreciate you extrapolating out on a number of these issues. It, it, it lends some comfort, particularly for what our residents will see as a change. Um, I think there's some more questions. Councilwoman Shepard Romy, you were going to ask something else. Uh, I believe uh, Count, uh, Vice Mayor Talt cleared up um, the issue that I was concerned about. Okay, um, any more questions from other council members? In that case, um, I will open it up to public comment. I don't see anyone present. Do we have anyone online? Um, actually, Mr. Dill Pedersen, he had to leave early, but he did ask me to read the letter that he brought with him that he was gonna read to all of you. Please, thank you. Um, it says, good morning, city council members, staff and guests. It's been a long two years. We moved to San Marino in 1970. Our two children attended San Marino schools, K through 12. We moved here probably for the same reasons most of you did. A beautiful small city, primarily single family residences on single family lots, large lawns with shrubbery, trees, and of course, well-maintained city landscaping, buildings, et cetera, and great schools. Fortunately, we have lived here for 51 and a half years. Our police and fire departments have kept us safe, thankfully. Here are the numbers, 365 days per year times 51 and a half years equal 18,797 days by 24 hours per day equal 451,128 hours protection each by our police and fire departments. They have protected us. Now we should protect them. We need to keep our police and fire departments staffed as our employees, please. Virus rules and mandates are being changed constantly throughout our country. We need to change no vaccination mandates. It is a personal choice, my body, my decision. I am not vaccinated and will not be. Thank you city council members for your service and thank you for considering keeping our police and fire departments personnel who have protected us so well for so many years and counting. Summary, please do not terminate employees for lack of vaccination. Respectfully submitted, Del L. L. Pedersen, 2140 Lorraine Road. Thank you. Do we have any other? Let me give a moment for any raised hands. I don't see any, no requests for comment from Zoom. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to bring this back for discussion and moving it forward. Councilwoman Shepard Romy. Well, good, I get to start. Um, <laughs> this is difficult. I wanna say that I respect and um, value all of our city staff, every member. Um, and I know that every member of our community does as well. And um, particularly our men and women who are in sworn service. Um, and a lot have built friendships and relationships with those individuals over time. Um, and it's important to understand that every city council member up here today has worked hard over the years to support um, our police and fire, particularly with public safety um, tax and parcel tax, excuse me as being a commitment that they get paid first and we wanna ensure that they always are, as well as um, from things like requests that we get for equipment and safety vests and the newest and um, things that are brought to us to really make them safe um, in their line of work where they go out every day and rush into danger and um, protect us. And um, so I find it incredibly difficult to know that there are 11 police officers, sworn members to protect and serve, who've taken an oath um, to do that, who are not willing to get vaccinated. Um, I, I believe science is undisputed. The vaccines are the safe, simplest, and most effective way to limit the spread and the consequential illness and death from COVID and that our residents have to a very, very high degree stepped forward and vaccinated themselves um, to protect each other, protect their loved ones. Um, and I look and I've been following Supreme Court case law, California case law, which have all upheld the constitutionality of the vaccine requirements. And The COVID vaccine saves lives of people. And we have several, many in our community, I would say, who have to remain unvaccinated, who can't, whether they're most vulnerable or children, or whether they're under medical care, um, such as cancer treatments, which often 
cannot, um, or organ transplants. I mean, I can think of many people individually here in town who cannot get vaccinated and really live in fear. And yet those are the ones that probably turn to our first responders to help them in a medical crisis because they're the ones that live on the edge of life every day. And I think we all know them. So I think um, since our residents look and depend on our police and fire, to keep them safe, that um, this is so hard for me because I too have people close. But um, I appreciate that you brought this forward in the difficult possibility that we have to separate with some of our officers. And I thank you for doing the hard work on this and for those officers that have stepped forward and are continuing to work in our community and protect and serve us. So thank you. I appreciate Gretchen's comments and uh would like to, to echo those. It's a tough situation. And John, I appreciate all the work you, you've done on this. Um, I think it's something we need to you know, continue to, to support. So thank you. Councilmember Huang. Well, <clears throat> Chief, um, I know you need this, but I can't support this because I'm, a, I'm a, against a vaccination mandate. Um, I mean, from this, from what I learned, you know, microbiology, you know, we all depend on our immune system. Anyway, but um, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't support this. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor Talt. Thank you, Mayor. I look at this just a tidbit uh, difference is, is all of uh, what COVID has done is highlight an issue. And that is at times police officers and other safety personnel may not be available for us. And this is a stopgap to to protect us under any instance. And, and uh, while I agree with this, the sentiment expressed here today, I, I view this as a lot larger. We don't know what's going to happen. And in, in a lot of instances. And so it's, it's advisable to have a plan like this in, in place. Uh, we're, we're not making any final decisions today other than to put a plan in place so uh, that's why I can most certainly support this. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for all your hard work, John. I know it hasn't been easy, but uh, I appreciate it. And um, I, I, I view it somewhat from your viewpoint, John. We've got to find a way for you to somehow sleep at night. And uh, this might be one way for that to occur. And thank you for having stayed with us through all of this. Um, aside from us, I know you have an attachment to so many of your officers. Um, thank you for your work on this. Do I have a motion? I move to approve the temporary contract police hiring program for the next three years and allocate funding from the general fund reserves each month as needed not to exceed $130,000 per year with the approval by the city manager following approval by the city attorney. Do I have a second? I'll second. Uh, if I can interrupt you, it's 130,000 a month. If you please go to- uh, Yeah, it's like, and it's, right. that's correct. Table one, the second from last on okay. your right, total cost, per month at 30 days is 123,000, for the outside okay. agencies. The true. annual increase though the, is 180,000, right? The true, but, and I'm not an accountant, maybe we need uh, Paul no, up like, here, but- like, uh, I can do this. She has to enter into a contract monthly right. of so, 123. So the, the issue okay. is that what we've given you here is base salary and you can take, I was just starting to do it. If you subtract uh, 108 from 123, you get the base 
monthly increase. But as Chief and Contra indicated, there could be other ancillary things that pop up. There could be extra overtime for those people. They could have court duties. There are other costs that might arrive. And so we rounded to this 130 per month number just in case of those things. But as I indicated earlier, this is always a worst case scenario. And if we don't need to spend that, God knows we're not going to. Okay, so the 130 a month is a million five against our current budget of a uh, million three. So it's, a, it's coming back to that an in, expected increase of $180,000 per year. Yes, worst case scenario. Okay. And they are also, if this is helpful, they're different line items. So personnel comes out of one account, contract comes out of another account, which is part of why we're needing to do it this way. Okay. okay. So are we okay with the way the motion is stated? Could you please read it back? No, because it's uh, yeah. not to exceed $130,000 per month. Yes, sir. Yes. With the approval of the city manager following approval by the city <laughs> attorney. Okay, thank you. And I had a second on that, correct? That is correct. Okay, roll call, please. Council Member Wong? No. <coughs> Council Member Shepard Rami? Yes. <coughs> Council Member Udi? Yes. Vice Mayor Talt? Yes. Mayor Jacobowski? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. At this point, do we have any written communications or public writings for distribution? We need to go to agenda item six or did we? Um, that's close. Or whatever it is now. I may if be. The, have yeah, it, since have we're going to go into closed session, if the mayor prefers to, to address the written communications and public comments and future agenda items now before we recess into closed session, we can. But do we need to adopt the resolution to continue hybrid public meetings pursuant to AB 361? Did we do that? Did I miss that? Don't. It, think this is in my. Oh, oh you that just may have, have been my mistake. That okay. may have been left over from a previous meeting. Sorry, I you got an extra staff. I, I was like, what? <laughs> I got extra more unnecessary. More <laughs> reading? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Bonus agenda. That, that will be on the next meeting agenda. <laughs> Should I just leave it in here? Sorry about that. I'm my so bad. Sorry. I did That's not. That's a present for you. You just keep that. I'm just turning the pages as we go along. Okay, I presume then that we have no written communication or public writings for distribution. Is there anyone wishing to speak at this time? Um, I am not seeing anyone in this room. Do we have anyone online who would like to speak? I do not see any raised hands, so no comments at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any items that the council would like to see on a future agenda? Yes, I would like to Following up on um, the public comments by, made by uh, Mr. Kwan during the opening public comment session, I would like to have Director Throne um, reopen discussion with Metro about the change of direction in those Metro funds, Measure R monies, and make contact there to see if that other, the, the I'm going to call them declined, I don't know what the correct word was, funds can be made available to San Marino. And if so, so. for future agenda, so yes. you want that you want to report on that on a future agenda. Correct. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? And I, I apologize for being a procedural stickler, but are there three votes I, to put that? Okay. Great. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Any other items, Councilwoman? No. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Any other council members like to put something on a future agenda? Um, okay, in that case, I will now adjourn the special meeting and recess the regular meeting to closed session.